All right, so uh, I will call them the, that we don't currently have a quorum, uh, so I'm going to sort of call the meeting to order as sort of chair pro tem until we have a quorum. Um, but I wanted to be respectful of our guest time and, and get the conversation started. And once we have a quorum, uh, we'll pause, officially call the meeting to order, and continue on from there. So. Awesome. Hi, I'm, my name's Tori, and I'm from the Winnipeg School Board, and Don asked me to come here to share um, a, a portion of the workshop I did at the Vermont School Board Association based on the community conversations that we've been having in Winnipeg, that we've had in Winnipeg, we started about six years ago. Um, so I'm just going to sort of, what I'm wondering, how this conversation will work best for you, my thought is to sort of give you an overview of how we've engaged community, why we feel like it's important, um, some of the work we've done, and therefore you all being able to ask questions so you can get the information you need um, about what we do and what the possibilities are, what the fears are around engaging community and all that. Does that sound like a reasonable thing? Okay. Well, I, I brought um, some materials. Do you want to pass that out? Um, so the one thing I'm going to leave here, there is an article. I want to start with sort of the why, um, why to engage community. There's a article. I don't have enough copies out. It's a pretty thick article, but the, the title is "Community Engagement Matters Now More Than Ever." And to me, the most important part of this um, article started out with um, a plan to redo the Newark school systems about 10 years ago, and it was with Christy Booker and Zuckerman. I don't know if you've heard about it, but they, the three of them announced that they were going to change the Newark school system from a failing system to a rocking system. And that's how the Newark citizens found out about it, was on the Oprah show. So they had a lot of money, they hired all the great people, and that's how they were going to do it, and it went down in flames. It did not happen. And so some of the quotes I put on the agenda the biggest piece was they adopted a top-down approach because they thought that the messy work of forming, forging consensus along, among local stakeholders might undermine reform effort. So I kind of wanted to start there of recognizing that engaging community is super terrifying. It is super messy, and it is, you know, it, there has to be a process involved to be able to think about, well, what do we want to ask? You know, how do, what will we do with the information? How is it going to inform what we're going to do with our work? Um, how there's that two-way street in an engaging community where it's, I want to ask, I want to know what you're thinking, but I also want to give you information about what's going on in the school, right? So there's this sort of two-way street. One way it helped us to sort of shape some of the things we were thinking about in that first page, um, I think Dawn said she might have shared it with you, is there's a public participation spectrum, which we found incredibly informative around what it means to inform the public. Now, this is broad, not just for education, but broad, you know, broad groups of in the public for their information. But a lot of times, I feel like, well, the questions that I ask underneath this is, you know, what type of communication do we, we use most often? Um, what type would help us grow as a board? What would we want to know and learn from our community? And then the questions get like, what do we aspire to? And engaging our community and and you know what's going to be our next best steps around this because generally if you look at we a lot of times we can be in the inform I'm just going to tell you what's going on and the promise around that is we'll keep you informed which is super important from a board's perspective too but you recognize that there's a whole other realm of being able to engage and being able to gather your information and help it influence decisions um, so what we did we um, use these things called neighborhood learning conversations. So we got a grant from Nellie May um, about six years ago, and the way we use that money is we decided we wanted to connect with our community first. So we hired facilitators, and we learned how to go out and have neighborhood learning conversations, which meant we asked um, community members to host in their houses. That's on the next page that you guys have in terms of um, how we shape that. And again, the biggest piece of it is we recognize what was fearful about engaging communities and what was possible with engaging communities so that we can hold both. When we go out and ask communities for their information, we're going to sometimes hear things that might not be what we want to hear. But if we're truly here to represent 
what's in the best interest of our communities. We need to be able to have a structure to hold both the things that are hard to hear and the things that are the wisdom that's there too, because you're going to get both of it. So I say that to say facilitation absolutely matters in being able to hold community conversations, whether it's a small community conversation, whether it's a large one, because community conversations can get tricky when it's not well thought out. And we need to make sure we have space for all the purposes, right? So um, this was a part of the way we would plan things. So some of the key attributes of it is, is um, the smallness of it. But really, what do, what do we want to know? What are the questions we want to ask? What are we willing to receive? And then what are we going to do with that information? And how are we going to share it back out? So that we have planned um, the whole entire feedback loop. I'm coming to you to ask you for information. I'm also coming to you to give you information. We're going to take this information, and this is what we're going to do with it. In our particular case, the first thing we asked was, we asked, what does it mean to you as a community for what is what matters most about kids to be successful from the school building? So we were asking a question to help shape our graduation expectations, which were our transferable skills. And that was one of the easiest questions to ask because everyone knows what they want for their own students and also community members who don't have kids. You know, what does it mean to be successful in this world? And so we got like 25 different attributes, but the data that we collected from that community absolutely helped to form a committee that was formed, multi-stakeholder group that went through it and we crafted our graduation expectations. We call them graduation expectations. They are the transferable skills. What happened with that? We, we ended, so that's driving part of our, um, our organ, certainly driving our organization. But the next question we as a board went out to ask when we switched over from the essential works of a board to policy governance is we asked our community to help us shape our end statement, which an end statement is at the end of your time in this school district, what are you going to be able to do out there in the world? And so we had the community help craft that. So that was a, a question we asked. We took some of the, the themes and the trends that came up out of those words and we crafted our end statement, which is the Winooski School District they will, will graduate, students will graduate college and career ready at a cost supported by the majority of the Winooski citizens. They will go on to lead healthy, successful, productive lives and be locally and globally engaged. So now what we do is we take that statement, we take those pieces, and we have conversations at our board table to help interpret. So what does it mean to be locally engaged? What does it mean to be globally engaged? Because we need to measure. If we say this is what we're going to do, we need to be able to measure and say, and this is how we're doing it. And, and can we get data from the superintendent to say, so how are we preparing? Are, are, are they college ready? Are they career ready? So we got all the colleges, um, the admissions folks, to come to the table and sit and have a 45 minute conversation with, with us about you're admitting our students into your schools. What does it mean to you for kids to be college ready? And the conversation was interesting because they spent probably 30 minutes of their time talking about soft skills. Do they know how to find help? Do they know how to go to a college a professor and ask them before their family had school? Do they know how to find their in-group? Do they know how to get involved? Do they know how to get around town? You know, they wanted them to be a broader community member as a student, not just the academics. So that was important information. And certainly when we had our career-ready conversation, all the, the businesses that sat at our table, they too talked mostly about <coughs> the transferable skills. They wanted them to see themselves as part of a bigger system. They wanted them to be able to get along with colleagues they didn't necessarily like. They wanted them to be able to know how to be professional when they're like a little grumpy. You know, they wanted them to know their skill set, but see how it matched the bigger piece of it. And so the big question is too, well then who's teaching all that? Because we as schools tend to be focused on um, content. So it gave us a, a, a broader view of why one transferable skills are super important and how it can drive content. Um, so it informed us about our own system, but it certainly informed us about what we were trying to prepare. How do we interpret that information to be able to measure that we are absolutely preparing them for these soft skills that the careers are asking for? So we also did a healthy, um, a healthy forum um, that I showed at the workshop um, just to show how that conversation would happen at a school at a, at a board table. So there's a couple different things I've talked about in terms of engaging community. One is being able to have some of these conversations once you know what you want, what kind of information you're looking for. Um, having it at the board, that's board work, is to link with 
the stakeholders with the ownership of, of this town and the school um, and taxpayers to really ask them what's most essential. So that's kind of a big, broad overview. Obviously, you guys have a book now. We do a, we, we started a book group at our board, and so we've been reading through this together. We only do like 15 pages because we don't have a lot to read um, anyway before. So that's, this has also helped deepen our ability to continue to remind ourselves how important it is to build a community too through our work as board members because we are representing them. We're representing our community. They voted for us to represent their voices, so we actually do need to go out and hear the voices and hear them in a structured way that makes sense, right? It's, it's also about that sense making. Again, what are the questions? What information can we receive that can influence things that are driving our organization? How are we going to gather that information? How are we going to make sure? who's not in the room so we can make sure that we're going out and specifically targeting groups who we really aren't hearing from, that we really want to hear from. Um, and then what are we going to do with that information and how are we going to report back out that we've heard. And we're looking for trends. And that helps some of the safety of asking for information because you're looking for big trends. In this packet, um, one of the conversations we did was around um, imagine a school system. And so you'll see the trends that came up. Um, we celebrated that with a big, huge co community conversation. And we got 100 ideas, and here's the top 10 that emerged. Recognizing that we're looking for trends helps to be able to hear all voices. Because we are looking for trends. We are looking for themes from our community. We can't do it all. Um, so, so that just shows what we can do with that information once it comes out. Also in here is really scripted facilitation notes. I'm gonna wrap back around to how important it is to have an incredibly good facilitator for these <laughs> conversations. We hired facilitators, and then we trained um, facilitators to do the, the small learning conversations, because that truly is one of the, as is important the questions you're gonna ask, and who's facilitating that meeting. And then how's that data being collected? How are we going to report back out to it? So that's kind of the big overview. <laughs> have you, um, I don't know how long you, the process has been going on kind of in this format in Winooski, mm -hmm. but have you found that it, because it sounds like you're getting the kind of feedback that's maybe coming back to your ENDS policies within policy governance. Have you seen any changes? of your ENDS policies so far that you could say are like directly attributable to your community engagement work? Well, one, they helped us shape it. One thing, yeah, as we started doing more of the conversations, part of it was like they're going to go on to lead healthy, productive, and successful lives. And then there was a part of us that thought, well, if they're locally, globally engaged, college and career ready, and healthy, isn't that a successful life? You know, and then how do you measure success? So that's what's interesting about creating a mission statement or a vision statement is actually pulling those you know, tangible pieces out and then asking other people for feedback. Well, how do you interpret that? Because that's going to help us discern, are we going to leave successful in there or are we not? Because it's a, it's a word, it's not a solid concrete statement that has to stay forever. It's, it's dynamic. It's going to be changing over time. It's certainly going to change based on the more information we're asking from a broad community-based members of, well, what does that mean to you? Is that truly what we're saying? So certainly we can change, because that's the one question we have. It's productive and successful. Hmm, how do we interpret that one, right? And who do we bring to the table to tell us what successful means? We haven't got to it, but that, that's, our big, that's our big question right now. Yeah. So something I feel like I always struggle with is when I think about my role as a parent, like what I want to talk about with the school is means. I don't really, I mean, like, yeah, the ends are important, but to me the ends, like, I want my kids to be successful because they learned French when they were in kindergarten. Right. Or you know, like so. I feel like I always am, am struggling with thinking about how to stru structure community engagement that talks about the ends when people really want to talk about the means. And so I'm curious how you guys have dealt with that challenge. Yeah. Um, we deal with it by being able to communicate, knowing what programs are being put in place by the superintendent that we hire to do their job. That's that's their work, and that's their work with the administration. But certainly there's a feedback loop of what are, like when we have our budget um, presentation, it has 
in it, here are the five things that drive an organization. The ends, the graduation expectations, personalized learning plans, project-based learning, student-centered learning, and wellness. And within those, um, we see also within our um, end statement, the goals and the programs, when we see them, the first one is college ready. Here are the programs that are supporting that. Career ready. Here are the programs that are supporting that. So everything's tied back into So we see what's happening based on that because we also have to measure that it's happening, but we can certainly communicate. It's not our job to say whether that program's working or not, but what we want to know is what's the information, what's the data we're going to get um, from the school, administrative, the, the experts that we've hired to do the work, how are we going to see that we're doing good, right? So it's not our job to know whether French is happening or not, but are they being, are they locally engaged? Are they globally engaged? Are they college and career ready? It's a part of the fabric. It, that's a razor sharp edge between the means and the ends. It can get tricky, but it's super important to remember our role, and our role is the ends. It is higher up in the building. We hire the people to do their expertise in that round. And it's hard to dip, you know, something to watch for. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you find that, I mean, these conversations were a few years ago, so do you find that you guys have continued with the conversations with less facilitation, or has the community come and wanted more? Like, I'm just curious, right. how, how, what is it like now? That's great. In the beginning. We just had our board meeting on, we're about to launch our next batch. Okay. So the last ones we did were in 2015, with, I think, the end statement, 2015. Um, so we do feel more, um, uh, we're certainly more courageous and we feel like we, we, we are based on the small success that we've had in doing that. So what we're going out for now, the question we're asking is what does Winooski mean to you? How do we rewrite our own narrative as Winooski? Mm -hmm. So we are a very small, diverse, um, high poverty district and the narrative is set for us in, in Vermont. Oh, Winooski, right? We, we get that a lot. And I know other schools probably get that too, but we want to make sure we're in front of our own narrative. So that's what we're going out to ask now is what are we proud of to, in, in Winooski? What are, what are we doing well? What can we improve on? What does it mean to be a student in Winooski? So we're also going to be asking these questions to students. So we're, we're, now we're thinking of doing 8th, ninth, uh, eighth, 10th, and 12th graders to get their perspective on what are they proud of as students, you know, so that we can take that information and help craft a Winooski narrative. We're also addressing equity in 21st century segregation. Um, so those are some tough conversations, but we've had prior success to that, and we know that we do want to have facilitators. We can facilitate the neighborhood learning conversation because we're really clear about um, what we're asking and what we're going to do with it. But we're still going to tap into experts to help make sure we're shaping those conversations well. Yeah. So we'll, we're launching that in January, and we hope to be done with them by May. So we take about six months to make sure we get everybody. We know in our own communities we need uh, we have like six six to seven different uh, major languages that so we need to make sure we have translation. There are some folks who don't want to have it in their homes. There's a, a lot of folks who do. So how do we navigate that? So we use the community center. We use restaurants. So we're looking at a broad range um, to get them out of, you know, to get folks out of the school building to have these really personal conversations and, get, and also get to know each other. You know, there's also that piece of building relationships. At the, the end of when we do neighborhood learning conversations, we do have a big community gathering um, to one share out the trends that have happened and eat together and celebrate, do a it's kind of a school celebration together. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. So can you estimate what percentage of the, your population you reach when, in a round of the community conversations? <coughs> Not to like put you on the spot, but I mean, is no, it like we did. a small um, amount or a large? It's, uh, for Winooski, we, we have, a, I mean, I think we got like 30 to 40% possibly, you know? That's huge. But we also know who we did not get. Yeah. In that yeah. patch. And that's really important for us is to know who was not a part of that. We also, with the graduation expectations and with the end statement, we also did um, surveys. So we had them up at the community center. We had them where parents could do it, like a parent teacher, com uh, parent teacher conference nights, computers out so people could also input their information in that way. So it wasn't all, not everyone wants to sit around 
talk about stuff, right? <laughs> so there's, there's that too. So we want to make sure that there was a variety of ways that we could get feedback in it. So um, yes, we use parent-teacher conference night as one way to get that information. It's hard to get a lot of voices at the table, yeah. a variety of voices. But we all, I think we all kind of know instinctively who we're missing. You know, like what groups we're not seeing and what parents we're not seeing, or, or what the senior citizens, we love going to the senior citizens, you know, being making sure that we, you know, involve their voice. They have a lot of wisdom to share. Um. So I'm um, discovering that two things need to happen in tandem board work and community engagement and board work is full-time essentially in terms of what we're doing things that we have to do the meetings we have to go to so how do we do the community engagement when you have some people who sit on four boards and five committees how how do they get the community engagement to happen or you have a 13 member school board that's doing all of the board work all of the time and it's becoming very clear to me anyway that we just don't have the time as much as we would like to do the community engagement we don't have the time um, and part of our monitoring process at the end of our board meetings we have a question did we link with the community? Yeah. And we've gotten better, yeah. <laughs> and it also depends on the topics that we're talking about, but a lot of times the answer is no, right. because we're doing board work. Um, and we need to go where the people are, so that means we need to be doing more gatherings and meetings. So do we get other community members who aren't voting members of the board to help us, how do you get that kind of buy-in? Where they're not, they're not a, they're critical to the work of the board, but they don't have the ultimate say in the decisions that we do get to make. Okay. Those are all good questions, and I think you know, there's not a simple answer to it. If it was, we'd all be going out incredibly engaged in our community, right? They voted us in, so we know that part of our board work is actually mm -hmm. the community is a part of the board but I, I definitely hear you. Um, the, it's not a perfect practice. It is something that we go out specifically for when we know we can use what information we want to help drive something, like again, the graduation expectations were real, the in-statement was real, and now us having, you know, wanting to shape a new narrative and bringing everyone back in. So that is actually, the, that type of well and then also breaking the in statement apart and, and inviting community members in to help us interpret those words that we said um, it's specific does it happen all the time no there's gaps in times that we do it we also have on our progress monitoring on our agendas who did something in the community this month right um, I don't have a perfect answer because it is integral in our work and yet it does seem like it's another thing to do with everything else going on. What I found in hiring um, facilitators is that takes a lot of the pressure off the organization of the meeting, of the running of the meeting, of the materials that need to be at those meetings. Um, you get experts in to help, and that's where we would spend our board money to be able to do that, because showing up to the meetings is one piece to it, but the organization and the pre-planning for it is a whole nother game. And I feel like it's such an important um, aspect of community is to build trust. And we build trust with our community when we are super prepared um, to really hear them. And then to do something about it and to get back to hear that. And so it's such an important relationship building between board and community that um, hiring someone to help is important. I know that the VSBA just got a grant um, for the year to help school boards hire facilitators um, to help with this work because we know it's super important and we also know exactly what you just said. It's, there's not all the time in the world for it. 
for it, right? So I know that can be super helpful is to, that the Vermont School Board Association is um, trying to make funds available to make sure this work can happen. But I don't have a direct answer to question. Have you, um, have you noticed uh, following, and it sounds like you did sort of an intensive round of community engagement work around your ends in 2015. Yeah. And following that, did you see a difference in terms of com community attendance at regular board business meetings? I'm just curious if there was a connection that felt like it fed back in terms of any increased New. attention to those. No, so. we do have more folks coming to our budget meeting, like when we present, but we also do that in tandem with our city. So they do their presentation, we do our presentation, we're in it together. So that had that that and we do that as a dinner. <laughs> we have a dinner person and then we talk about money. <laughs> and dinner is how much is it gonna cost you? No, so. um, but I I would say um, we do not see community coming to the board itself unless we invite them for a specific conversation. And and then we invite folks for that, like sitting at the board table having a conversation with us. But it has not changed. Yeah. You know, one piece of information we got um, from one of the Somali leaders was, the more you ask us what we want from education, the less we think you know what you're doing. <laughs> or the more we think you, you, know, you don't know what you're doing. You know, because that, that's a different cultural difference. But every time we kept asking more questions, it was like, it makes me think you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so it's like, okay, that's good to, that's also good to uh, hold also. But then they're wrapping back around and giving information, yeah. We don't have a lot of visitors. And, so, and, and sadly and, and goodly enough, um, if people don't come to board meeting, you're like, woohoo, they might trust us, right? If they're not here, um, kind of bothered about something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hire a specific facilitator that worked for the company? or We hired um, Sue McCormick for our in statement, batch of in statement. Um, Conversations, and then we hired. Um, we had folks from Eagle Rock um, come out. They, uh, one of the women that who worked for Eagle Rock uh, used to work in Burlington. Her name is Sarah Petucci, and she helped us with the graduation expectations and all that. But they have a professional development center that does facilitation work and how to get how. I, I think the brilliant thing about facilitation is you can. It, it gives you a container to hold the fear and the wisdom rises, and it gives people a way to communicate and get to a higher place of what matters most, what's most essential about whatever it is that you're asking. And that's why that's so super important, because the fear does need to be in the room. You know, people have had hard experiences with education, right? It does cost money, so we've got to make space for that. And those facilitators are excellent at that work. Can you tell me a little bit more about what those the um, sorry the meetings at the houses the neighborhood the learning conversations, conversations learning yeah. conversations like so I see that you say there were like ten or twelve participants so yes. there would be there would be a board member and ten or twelve participants yeah. and it would be at like a neutral party's house or I mean it would be someone it wouldn't be the board member necessarily <laughs> right. that was hosted and then is the board member the facilitator at that? Uh, not at those meetings. Those okay. ones. I think Allison and I are both the board members on the our community. I think we are going to facilitate those meetings. Um, and we're still, uh, we certainly will with the students um, and at the PTO meetings, like getting the parents to let them know what this whole host is going on. But it depends on what question, how, what the comfort level is. I, I feel like it's probably not um, best practice to go out and facilitate them yourselves um, right off the bat. Um, because it does need to be a neutral party so that you're trying to gather information. You want to also want to level the playing field. Um, the one good thing about neighborhood learning conversations is to ask a question about something that makes everyone on the same level. And everyone's voice goes into the room immediately on something that brings us all together, not keeps us separate in our roles. And as a board member, we, are, we have a different role. And so it is good to have someone else facilitating that piece. It's also important to have a note taker. What we found is we like to do the chalk top, which is like white pieces of paper with sticky notes on it because you can roll them up and then look at the data too and group them together. We used to take endless notes on computers um, to be able to pull those words out and that is super tedious getting all the information. But 
you want to honor the fact that if we are calling you together to ask for information, you want to get every word that they're saying, like what's most important. And if someone says something, it's not a mistake, you know, it needs to be up there because again, you're going to, we use, we call those things and put them into categories to find those trends of what mattered most. Um, but I think the facilitation, to start out with neighborhood learning conversations, it's good to get a facilitator to do that work. So neighborhood learning conversations are affinity groups. Right, so it's people, so if I host it in my house, I'm inviting 10 of my friends, right, that are like me, right? So that, that's an affinity group, and that's an intentional affinity group because you want people to feel comfortable. It's the big community groups where we're trying to mix people together. Um, we certainly do affinity groups because one, we have languages, but we also want people to feel super comfortable to have conversations about what matters most to them about their towns, their children, and their schools. This is one of the most essential things of being a human being is how are we caring for our kids? How are we caring for our communities? So we do want people to be comfortable. And so would the board member be the note taker or that would be another person? We didn't go to all the, all the neighborhood learning conversations. We hired, for, we had people facilitate it so there was sort of a script and then we got, they gave us that information back. So we didn't go to all the neighborhood learning conversations. Okay. It might be a little bit different this time but we did not in the, the first two rounds do that. We were, we were obviously there at the big celebration ones, too, and some of us hosted some of the conversations, um, but it was not required that one of us be there. How many did you have, do you think? Oh, Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. 30-ish? That can be like 20? You know, we, yeah. Different neighborhoods? Yeah. Over six months? As Over well. six months, yeah. Well, this time we're doing longer six months. I think we did it in a shorter span the last few times. Um, the last two times we did it in a shorter span of time, kind of got it in there. But we kind of want to take a longer time with this one. And, and again, make sure, like learning from, like, ooh, let's make sure we have, especially with affinity groups, what groups are not together. You know, what groups are we not together. Yeah. So when you did attend, <laughs> I'm not gonna leave it alone. Sorry. When yeah. you did attend the neighborhood learning conversations, did, were you just a listener? I was just a community member because we're also community members or, or a parent, you know, I'm both. So I sit in as a parent and a community member. So you were a participant then in the participant. conversation. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So who's hosting that event? Is that a board-hosted event technically because you hired the facilitator, um, or, or is it? I mean, how would you how would you look at that? About it that way. Um, it's, it's hosted by a person who's willing to have people come into their house. And there's, there's <laughs> snacks and, you know, you introduce it like what the point, you know, you introduce the intention. I wish I had a neighborhood learning conversation um, facilitation tool. I could send you guys one. Um, but it's, it's about, a, you know, an hour long thing around, um, you know, we're, we're looking for information about, at this point, it's about crafting or So prior, it was about what is it, you know, what makes kids, what do you think makes kids most successful in life? What's important to learn in school? It would get down to content sometimes, and we would go, but what are the traits? What are the traits we want? We, there's a, a script, like a, a shape of a gingerbread person. It's like head, hands, heart, feet. What do you want them to think? What do you want them to feel? What do you want them to do? Where do you want them to go? You know, and that keeps the conversation at a higher level versus I want them to do personal finance, and I want them to have French too, and I want them like, whoop, whoop. Um, so that keeps the conversation. So that's why the questions are super important. Um, but in terms of who's hosting it, it's, it, I mean, we, we're driving it or, or asking for it, but it's about community conversations. So I don't know if we really ever specifically. But in a sense, the school board is hiring the facilitators yeah. and, are do, and are providing the uh, script, so to speak. Yeah, for the, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's when we were doing that prior, it was Partnership for Change, which was our grant. So we, so why I'm thinking you know, like, did we ever say this is a new school board? But they knew that was information we had to prior. Like the board wants to know, like we are going to be using this information. Certainly with the end statement, that was more right. of a clear direction because um, the graduation expectations was a, our first. That makes sense. You kind of partnered with another partnered, organization yeah. to kind which of which was us roll I mean, it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So partnerships or change was was Winooski Burlington together through that grant that we that we were awarded. I see. Yeah, okay. but they were that we hired them. So it wasn't like it. a standalone five hundred one c three or something. No, it was, no, no, it was no, two no. Yeah, but like when we go back out, we will 
it will be us going to the community saying let's have these conversations together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who coordinated these 30 or so conversations, uh, neighborhood <coughs> learning conversations? Yeah. Who coordinated that? Was, that? was that the hired facilitators? They okay. coordinated it. Um, we this year this time we're doing it. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how it goes with us doing it. Um, and I think that uh, it helped having someone guide us. It was most essential. Mm -hmm. um, so that we didn't drop the ball along the way. Because it is a lot of information to gather. It is a lot of work. Um, and it's super important. Um, you know, I, I can't say it'd be interesting to, to poll our community now to say, do you, you know, here's the end statement. Do you feel like you helped write that? You know, and because people are moving, you know, on, and, and, and that's why it's important also to keep it going, because we're also moving and changing also, and, and students are moving on and changing, and families, and and so we're trying to set something that becomes a part of what we do every couple years is bringing in something intensive like neighborhood learning conversations. I think the informing, and what was the other, the informing and the consulting on little things along the way makes sense too along the way, but making sure it's a part of our governing practice. But going out for neighborhood learning conversations is a pretty intensive batch of information gathering. That's why I asked because there's no way we could do that. I mean, somebody right. would, not be doing well <laughs> at the end of coordinating right. all of those right. things. Right, no, that's why you hire someone. And, and again, hopefully, you know, definitely tap into Vermont School Board Association to see how, you know, what that grant looks like. Yeah, because I know Sue McCormick is going out doing some big work with the community. Yeah. How, um, do you think that you gained financial support and buy-in from your community through the process? I think of, like, mm -hmm. that the vibe hasn't been all negative about the schools or that it's increased morale. I just get curious about yeah. if the conversation you think is worth it that way. I, we feel really supported. Um, and I think it's it's interesting too because again, it's a, you know, it's it's Winooski and you know we, we have a complica really complex, complicated population that is we're all in this. And I feel like our, our budgets have passed um, for the last ten years straight and um, we keep you know especially the budget season we also use budget season um, when we're presenting our budget, once we get to it, we use that as a conversation too. I mean, we've made decisions, right? But but to inform them based on how's this going to impact you, we, we know this is going to impact you. We also try to take the information from the state and try to make it understandable in terms of what we're up against. Because these last two budgeting seasons mm -hmm. have been kind of kooky, right? Um, but we want them to know that we hold their needs in direct balance with what the school needs too. Like, you know, they're they're intertwined and they're both incredibly valuable, you know, and, and so we want them to know that we um, hold how our decisions are going to impact them, you know, greatly. We hold that. Yeah. I owned a house in Winooski back in the early nineties and that's a great turnaround because the budgets would get shot down every year. It was just endless. Yeah. So you mentioned the PTOs, and I, I apologize that I don't know how many actual schools you have in Winooski. If you you have two, it's one big one. One so big we're pre K twelve. Yeah, but so you we have said one PTO. PTO. You have one PTO. So how can you tell me a little bit about how you engage the PTO as part of your community engagement? Well, we'll go to their, we're going to uh, see if we can get invited to their meeting um, to say, you can hear the next batch of conversations we're about to go out for and hear the questions we're going to ask it and also ask those questions for them because they're, they're great um, to help us find people who would host and to involve them in helping us get all that set up in terms of people who are willing to host in their houses. What about groups we might be missing? Would that be better at Papa Frank's? You know, would that be better? How can we organize that. So we're definitely going to tap into the expertise and, and wisdom of our parent groups to help with that. For sure. And is there any other way that you engage with your PTO for your your kind of I don't know, for better lack of a better word, your mm -hmm. regular but board parent group? parent groups? Yeah. Um I you know some of us go to meetings, um, but I wouldn't say that they're 
there's a regular routine in place for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting, and I won't mm -hmm. get too far into it, but so our articles, because we just um, passed our Act 46 unification mm -hmm. a little while ago. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> it's exciting, still. Um, but our articles contemplated um, local councils, I forget, local advisory councils, and so we haven't spent a lot of time as a new unified board talking about that. But there, I think, kind of theoretically, there's some blurriness, at least in my mind, about sort of what a PTO is and what this hypothetical local council is and what the board is. So I was just mm -hmm. curious how you know, anything you might be doing, we might be able to learn from that. Right, so. right. Thank I mean, you. Certainly, a very distinctive groups, right? But uh, I think we could do better of making sure we're informed, you know, and, and that there's a, a collaboration. You know, it feels like we collaborate, but they do a lot of stuff for our school, which is amazing. They have great power, you know, they do things, you know, that in the best interest of our school. So it's important to be on, you know, honoring that and understanding what they're doing and how we can support, how they can support, how we support all of, all of us together supporting our students. Yeah. <coughs> so PTO, so that means you're engaging with teachers, which I think is great at a time other than negotiations mm -hmm. so but it's in a different way because I remember a conversation around that being tricky and uh, to talk but as long as you're talking about the specific questions because I think teachers know an awful lot about oh, what, what about these different things and they're engaged with the community certainly so I so that is a time when you're having a conversation with them mm -hmm. So we actually, Alex and I, um, as we were having a meeting on Sunday about us launching off, and that was one of the groups um, to consider was having a conversation with a, a small group of teachers, you know, and asking the same questions. What are you proud of? You know, what, what's going well for you? Again, not in, you know, like staying out of the means, but what feels good about being a part of this community? Where do you feel like we can, we, we can improve on and, you know, because I think that that's an important piece. We can't, we wouldn't have schools without teachers at all, right? It is super, it's students and teachers, right? I mean, that's what's really, what's driving this organization. Um, and it's important to know their perspective in a really clear role, right? In a, in a really clear role. Um, but if we're going out trying to shape our narrative, I mean, there's certainly a part of the narrative, absolutely. And separate from that, um, so right now, I think what we were most recently talking about was community engagement around the budget. So um, I think that's what we were trying to figure out was how to, when to present what we know about it and how to do that and how to get the community involved in it so that we make a budget they like. And then, I mean, that's, I think that's what we're specifically working on trying to engage with right now. So what have you done? Do you all have like four volunteers from the community to sit on your budget meetings through the process? So we, we um, our job is to write bonds with one person from the community to come sit. And how many budget meetings do we have? It starts tomorrow. Um, one, you know, like there's five through the month of December. So we have four community members sit at the table with us and they ask questions. Wait, you have know, five budget meetings in December? Uh-huh, every Wednesday. Well, there's one that's potentially, if we get it done, <laughs> there. So it's uh, this is tomorrow, and then uh, straight through. I think we take a break over Christmas break, and then we'll meet again at the beginning of January. Yeah. So they can sit at the table. They sit at the table, and they ask questions. They listen to the presentations. They are, what I mean, absolutely. And, and it does help. It helps to hear their perspective. And it also gives us a different lens, you know, a different view into it. You know, what's it sounding like? And sometimes, it, you know, generally we have like uh, two folks who've been in Winooski, you know, for generations and, you know, some new parents coming in, you know. So it's, it's, help, it's also, that's actually how I got on the board was I, I started, that was what I did, you know, so it's like six years ago. Yeah, bring your buddy, bring a friend. <laughs> oh, we'll do this together. How yeah. many people are on your board? We have five. Yeah, so we have we have we use four spaces for the senior members. Yeah. So do you just change the you just write that on the agenda that they're just no that's not you can just do that. 
We just do that. We just do that. I don't think we write anything different other than we just invite them. Awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, are they at the real board meeting? Yeah, they're still sitting there at the, at the regular board meeting when, when we're talking about the budget, you know, in that board meeting, and then they sit on the side. How many students do you have in, two. in your district? Oh, only two, just two. <laughs> <laughs> and five board members. <laughs> we just have two students on our school board. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have, ooh, we have, eight, oh, no, like not 900, because we're up, so it's like 855, almost 870 in the whole district. We're right under that threshold of 900. Yeah. <laughs> and so the two students that sit on your board, that's all the time? Or during, during budget, or? No, all the time. They're regular members, yeah. No, not regular members, they're student representatives, right? But they have a piece. Uh, they also engage, but we're, our goal is to have them engage in the conversation. You know, really hearing from their perspective. They have um, one of our students, one of our student representatives, um, last year created a whole process for how their the students are nominated and how the students nominate their representatives. Um, so it's not about popularity contests. So they have this whole thing of um, essays, and you don't have names on them. And anyway, so they and the, so the students did that. They they created their own process for how they're going to elect the members to represent them. And bless their hearts, they sit through the whole board meeting. <laughs> but we want them to talk through it, yeah. And they give us a report, like a student report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you decide, or the four community members that sit with you during the budget discussions, how did you come up with four people? I'm not sure. It was there before I started on the board. Okay. Right? So I, because I was one of four. It works. It's a nice number. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah. Did somebody invite you? Huh? Uh, it was put out. We have a district newsletter that because we don't have a newspaper in Winnie so it's a district newsletter, and it always asks for volunteers. You know, could someone volunteer? And then you call the the superintendent's office and say, "I'd like to volunteer." Like, sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's nice to have. It's nice to have that, those voices. I think it, it also changes our conversations at the table too. You know, quite frankly. Because uh, anyone can come and you know be a, a community member and sit, but when they're sitting at the table with you and really taking in the information as we're taking in the information, they're getting it the same. You know, they're they're taking it in and asking questions and well, what if, you know that kind of stuff. That's important. So I just want to be mindful of your time. We have like five more minutes, and I don't know if anyone has a pressing question. They were hanging on to the last minute. Now, now's your chance. I'll ask a question, and if no one else has a pressing one. So you mentioned a newsletter. Is that a school board newsletter? or a It's school a school newsletter? district newsletter. And actually, we just, um, the city joined it probably a couple of years ago. So we, we really have a, um, we govern, we, we, our governing bodies work together. So we, um, we have a city school board meeting together once, twice a year, actually, um, and do it together. So I mean, we're a small city. Um, but we, yeah, but it comes from the district. It, we, it's in our budget, general, in the general, it's the district news, yeah. And, and we all do, and, and a board member has an article in there once a month, they're like, oh, it's in my terms. <laughs> so um, it's mailed out? Then? It's mailed out to everybody in the community, yeah. Caleb, that sounds like the Starkboro system. The yeah. scoop. A little bit like the scoop. Yeah, yeah. that's nice. Yeah, and because we can highlight all the things in the school, the city has a couple pages, yeah. and it's just a little fold over thing. It's great. That really helps. Um, and that was actually something on the cutting block when I was on there um, before my kid was, she was a kindergartner. She, was, she wasn't a kindergartner yet. And I was like, that's how I know what's going on in the school is someone of my kid's not in there yet. Like, no, let's not let, let that go. You know, so that was a community voice thing. And we um, did a survey. People do read it. You know, I try to have it translated. It's translated on the website. But. And we actually are on the website, too. So I would just say, you know, it is worth getting the help to do it. And then being really super clear as a board, you know, where can you involve student voice in what you're doing? Where, where the direction that's driving, you know, driving this organization? You know, where does it fit to have their voice in? So they can really feel part of this organization. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Good, thanks thank so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Really yeah, it. yeah. I'll leave these Argos um, right there for uh, you know because you don't have enough to read. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. There's never enough to read. Excellent. Enjoy the book too. I'm, that's really fun. Thank you. you guys are doing it. Yeah, it's super fun. <laughs> okay. Well, have a wonderful right. night. Good luck with the rest of the morning. Oh, it is. Yes. All right. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Drive safe. All right. So, um, this is I will call us to order at 7 o'clock since we're at week we four of no. <laughs> Way to go, Megan. Sorry. 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 I'm serious. Okay. Is there any public comment? <laughs> Okay. All right. That was what everyone thought. Or one, one yeah. I do have a public comment. Okay. Um, as of what yesterday, um, I spoke with Mary Arbuckle. Um, since the renovation, uh, the school is like kind of a really huge issue, or not an issue, a big important project that's going on. Uh, Neat does want to get more involved with it, and uh, are offering that like to give people a voice and like a, a medium to actually use it on, as well as any board members that would like to speak on it or other issues that might come up in the future that um, are important for the community and need community outreach. Uh, need TV is a good way to do that, to start doing it. Great. Yeah. All right, great. All right. Thank you. I, I move to approve them. All right, Kayla and Allison, was that a second? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> all right, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Right, any abstentions? All right. Um, we are now down to executive limitations monitoring to accept the monitoring reports. Um, and they are all, they are all for produced in one document, but they're separated on our agenda. So um, we can go through them singly. Remember, this is an exercise for us because we, yeah, we have no authority. So it's just an exercise for us. <laughs> um, practice. It is practice. Um, so I can give you a little bit of the sort of the context. Uh, so there are three policies, 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3, that are the ENDS policies. Uh, and I believe historically they've been, um, there, there have been monitoring reports created separately for each of those. I think the struggle has been in, in that time to, to report on one and not have it tied to the others because of the interconnectedness of those three ENDS policies. And so this year for the first time, uh, what boards are seeing is a single ENDS monitoring report that encompasses all three of the ENDS policies. Uh, and so that's what you have before you. And so I, I sort of provided a bit of a narrative to talk more globally about the, the report. And there's a very brief summary in the end. Um, and ENDS policies are, are interesting for many of the reasons that Tori brought up. Um, some of the things that we identify as what we want to see in ENDS can be difficult to measure. Um, and it can be very difficult to identify when have we achieved what it is we've set out to achieve. Like, so what there, where is there in education? When can we say we're there? Personally, I don't think it exists. Right. There is no there. We're never, we've never gotten to the end of our journey. Um, as you progress, you move your target, um, which makes it hard also to be able to say, I'm in compliance or I'm not in compliance, um, because of that sort of moving target that, that we're always striving for, which is why you'll see in my summary I say that we're making reasonable progress. 
Uh, I'm in the process of drafting a, a more detailed narrative about why I think we're making reasonable progress. And I can sort of summarize that for you um, here, knowing that the executive committee tomorrow night will get sort of the more elaborate uh, narrative in hard copy. Basically, my, what I would summarize is, in particular for the assessments that are noted in here, in terms of academic progress, we are nowhere near what we would deem as being there. Like we're not, we're not at all satisfied with the results that you see on NECAP, SBAC, and some and some other academic assessments. Um, there's a lot of work to be done there, and that work is happening. I think the strategic planning work is sort of the big picture way to focus our energies to work to achieve better results for students. Uh, we're talking about some really exciting different ways of thinking about how we utilize our resources. Um, in particular, as we're building a difficult budget, to think about <coughs> not just how do we meet a difficult budget target, but how do we do that, which likely means reduced staffing while improving outcomes for students. Like maintaining outcomes is not acceptable. We have to, even with fewer people, even with meeting a difficult budget target, work to improve outcomes for students. Um, and the way we do that is not by doing more of the same with fewer people. It's doing something different than what we've done in the past with fewer people. So that's the kind of work that's happening. Uh, it, was, it began last year with strategic planning. It's happening now as we're working to build a difficult sort of budget um, for next year. Which is, and it's that kind of work that we're doing. Um, our ability to collect and analyze and discuss data is at a point where it hasn't been, I think, in, in the memory of anyone in our organization. Um, I don't know who goes back further, Katrina or Susan. Susan. <laughs> um, but in conversations we're having, we're, we're in a better position now than we've been in 10 years, 11 years, 11 years. Um, so we aren't there, we will never be there, but I think it's important for the board to know where I'm coming from is where we are right now isn't satisfactory. We have to do better. Um, and I believe we're setting the foundation for that um, in the work that's happening, which is why I think I can say we're making reasonable progress. And I don't know that I'll ever be able to say anything but we're making reasonable progress because either we're working hard at making the improvements we need to make or we're not, and I don't see us ever not working hard to make the to make that progress, and knowing we will never be there. It doesn't exist. So that, more or less, is what I'll have in hard copy for the executive committee tomorrow night, um, as to sort of the summary of what you see in here, um, but also kind of where I stand in terms of why I think we're making reasonable progress. And part of the narrative in the beginning, uh, in this sort of opening statement on the report, speaks to, for sure, there's an aspect of education that is making sure the students know what they need to know, sort of that content aspect. Uh, and again, Tori talked a little bit about that. But again, as Tori talked about, there's so much more to it than just the content knowledge. It's those soft skills, those transferable skills that are so important that she's saying she's hearing from colleges and businesses saying those are critical. Um, that's, and, and those are spoken to in the transferable skills. That's an area I think that's uh, more of a relative strength for us. You know, the, the scores on the academic assessments are not something we're, we're very satisfied with, but some of the other work that's happening for those transferable skills are some of the areas where we have more successes and those are articulated in here as well. Um, so there's a little bit of the context of the ENDS report. Uh, kind of my thinking on it, but I'm happy to answer any other questions. And Katrina's here, and she, she certainly took the lead on creating this, and it's a, I think it's a great document, um, and one that we'll continue to build on over the years as we produce a single and monitoring report. I think it was important to um, set a often says tell the story, so that throughout this, you're also getting some highlights of um, graduates to the best of our ability as a first sort of shot at that. 
Um, and you're also seeing some data sets that we've never um, presented to you before. So I look at some of this as foundational data by which to then build. Um, and some of the assessments are newish, and then some of them are going away. So there's always a little bit of a pendulum swing when it comes to the tools that we are providing. But as Patrick said, we now at least have a format so that when we are providing you data sets, you're not trying to interpret the report itself every single time, as we've been doing for many years now. We've been doing this for a while. Um, so I'm, I'm excited by that piece. It, it is always, for me, it's always a struggle. Um, as uh, Jennifer was speaking to the means and ends line. Um, putting, you know, little anecdotes by the principals is certainly not an ends, and it's not something that we had in our interpretation, but again, it helps sort of with that narrative to kind of give you a b better picture of what a day in the life of our graduates may have looked like as sixth and twelfth graders. So we'll, we'll have to continue to get the feedback from everybody, and I'm interested in tomorrow night, and to also kind of go back and reflect again with the Policy and Governance Committee who really helped put a lot of energy into a new interpretation and this format. I thought it was interesting, the idea that she shared about not necessarily the specific classes, but to some extent saying that this area, this ends is covered by these sorts of but they have access to these classes to an extent. I mean, I don't know how complicated that would get, but I thought that was interesting, an interesting suggestion. Um, just showing, even so people even know what math classes you do, because uh, integrated math is unique, but it's a unique thing. So like maybe just so you even know. Um, so not to, I wouldn't be encouraged I'm not saying I would encourage a discussion around specifically choosing them, but seeing what's there is great. Like if you go to a college and there's a list of classes kind of thing, so that people know what those are and, and how they relate to some of these things. Like uh, I know that there are ones that specifically do speak to the ends policy, social, community, that policy, American history even. Some like uh, things, so I thought I thought that was interesting. I don't know what it would look like, but I thought it was a good idea. And then I think it's important for when we're doing parent, when we're doing community engagement, and this the soft skills. Um, yes, the school has a role. I think parents need to be aware of these soft skills that we want children to have and that businesses want them to have. So as a board, I think maybe we could try to have it be a goal that we're communicating what businesses want and jobs and careers and colleges, not just putting that on the school, but maybe making sure the rest of the community is aware of what colleges and businesses are looking for from children because we have them the rest of the time. And those are things that don't necessarily need you can work on at home so I think we could try to make those really well known beyond just giving it back to the school and I noticed that in the I know it's later on here but Phil Scott in his letter he mentioned a lot more freedom and flexibility being worked in for teachers. So that might have in the education system a lot more of that. And so I think that might be board work or something for us to keep in mind as you're trying to develop a new system for um, how to make things work with less. And that they, so that was one of his suggestions was to make sure that the flexibility is there for people to make the decisions that are best so that you can do that. So if there are policies or things in place that we might want to look at again and see if altering some of that would give the flexibility needed. So that's a lot of different topics, but those are just things that I, we might need to think about so that you can do the most with what you have. Um, so, Patrick, when you are talking in your opening letter about making reasonable progress, and then you have questions, are we providing 
in education to the students of NESU at a cost that the tax taxpayers in our five towns support. Um, that's not really the question I wanted. More the academic ones. Um, sorry. subjects um, so when we see the data and you see that 40% of the kids are proficient in a core discipline do you I don't do you provide explanation as to what you're going to do since you are acknowledging that's not reasonable acceptable do you um, explain kind of the next step to get beyond that 40% for that's not necessarily that specific grade, but but yes, for that grade, but then also the kids that are coming behind. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? Just to get an explanation. We see the data, but um, we're on the board, so it makes a little more sense to us, but somebody else just looking at this might say, well, 53% competency that's a little over half of our students in that specific skill. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to address that and what are your plans? Um, how do you envision getting more and more above that 53%? So maybe we can be closer to 90%. We know we'll never be 100%, but, and maybe that's something we as a board need to decide. And I know it's N um, means, but um, we need to be able to explain to our community also, um, especially when we see comments about um, not so nice comments <laughs> that I've been seeing lately, um, to be able to say, yes, we are doing something, something, and the goal is there to do that. So the answer, which I, I find myself giving often, is it's complicated. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's not so discreet as, you know, these are the math scores and we're unhappy, and so this is specifically what we're doing in math to address that. Um, at least not at this point. Right now, we're doing a lot more work on some systems needs mm -hmm. uh, that, that are intended to address not just, say, a specific sort of deficiency in math that we're seeing, um, but when we're addressing systems needs, we're looking at how we, how we use resources within the system differently <laughs> that we're anticipating we see improvements across the, the, right. the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, looking at, looking at data, so the, so the NECAP or SBAC data, those are useful to a point, but we also need to be looking at our local common formative assessment data and analyzing that sort of in, in a more, so these other assessments tend to happen once a year for, for many of them. And that's helpful to a point, but we need information more regularly than once a year to be making decisions uh, as we go. So we're getting better at looking at that data, collecting it, having it in a place where everybody can see it, and therefore our ability to use it will improve. And that's not just in the area of mathematics, but something else. So that's in a, across the board. So that's one example of a systems mm -hmm. uh, piece of work that's happening that will improve outcomes across uh, all subject areas. We're also talking about um, how do, we, how do we build capacity within our organization to ensure that the best practices in content areas um, and really just in teaching in general are happening with consistency, consistency classroom to classroom, school to school. Um, I, I think we would, we would argue that there isn't currently the capacity to do that. So we need to think about, again, how do we organize folks to develop that capacity to ensure that those practices are happening, which will improve outcomes for kids. So it's not, those sorts of things aren't necessarily targeting something but systems changes that will set the stage for improving outcomes for students. Thank you. Anyone else? I'd just like to say thank you, Katrina, for putting this together. This is amazing and a lot of work. So thank you to you and all of those that helped you. If there's nothing else, then our task is to accept the monitoring report. 
You can start with 1.1, you can start with 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. You choose to make the motion. I'll make a motion that we accept the monitoring reports. 1.1, uh, core subjects, 1.2, life and career skills, and 1.3, learning and innovation skills. Can we do them as a law? I think, yeah, those three, because we received okay. them. Is there a second? I second it. Any more discussion? All those in favor of accepting the monitoring team monitoring report for 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Then we have um, another one, 2.5, Emergency Superintendent Succession. Monitoring. I make a motion that we accept that mon monitoring report, 2.5. Right. Is there a second? Thank you. Any discussion? I'm sorry, maybe you guys explained this when I was out of the room, but I'm just, like, we looked at all these last month, but I guess we didn't look at them at this board, we only looked at them at the local boards. Is that why we're doing them now? Yes. I, like, I kind of feel like we did this yeah. already. Well, so. we looked at, well, <laughs> we looked at them at the local board, or at the executive committee meeting, it was presented. Then, this is the, this would be the month, or the next time the local boards meet, they're gonna take action and okay. provide their feedback or anything, you know, all that, so. Although the local boards, it's gonna work a little bit the last month at the local So the, so last month, so what has to happen first, so the executive committee currently is the only board that takes action to accept monitoring reports that I prepare. Um, but they wanna do so with feedback from local boards. So local boards have to review the monitoring reports first, which was last month, and provide feedback to the executive committee. So your work last month in reading through this and 2.5 was to provide feedback to your board chair who will bring it to the executive committee so that the executive committee can take action with your input as a local board. This board is kind of going through the motions right now just to kind of get used to the process of um, both accepting interpretations and accepting monitoring reports. So eventually, like, it'll be way more streamlined when it's one board because a, a draft interpretation will come to you as a board. You will accept the draft interpretation. That gives me the green light then to go and actually write the report based on that interpretation and then you take action on the report. We'll get there. Yes, but right now we have to do this sort of flipping floppy Oh, we're not really doing something, but we are doing something, kind of thing. Yep. So, so. Yeah, the, the uh, Policy and Governance Committee thought it would be useful for this board to have, for its policy work to mirror the Executive Committee's policy work, because that kind of gets the routine built a little bit ahead of the July 1 date when this is the official board that's doing that work. Okay. And they're also seeing, you're, we're seeing the work here, so you're kind of becoming aware of it as in this new system mm -hmm. so I, I guess I can see some benefits of that and I certainly don't want to doubt any recommendations from the policy and governance committee it's just hard when you hear board members talk about not having enough time to do things that are really important for us to do and then <laughs> spending you know talking about these things at three different meetings uh, you know so I guess maybe there's a balancing act the woes of a supervisory union turning into a supervisory <laughs> discipline. And in the meantime, we have to talk about stuff more. Exactly. Right now. More. <laughs> so that's, I mean, right now, it's just, you know, practice. We just practice. So if you have a, an opinion and you're not on one of the local boards and you want to send it to that board chair, I would definitely do that. But um, right, right now, we could. We have nobody's input but our own right here now. All right, so if no one needs any further discussion, all those in favor of approving or uh, accepting the monitoring report for 2.5 emergency superintendent succession, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Okay. Update on the budget development. So. 
think the, the place to start with the update on the budget development is what we were looking at on sort of a back of the napkin kind of number last month when we met. It looked like about 1.7 is what we were thinking. Uh, after going back and doing some further scrubbing and really looking at personnel changes that have happened, et cetera, and then rolling that forward. So that 1.7 that you heard last time was sort of a budget to budget. If, if this year's budget was rolled forward uh, and became next year's budget with all the assumptions about what we know about next year, that was the 1.7. We've since gone back and the, and the business office has worked pretty intensively on this in the pretty much for the entire month since we met last time to really do that scrubbing to get a sense of with the actual people and considering all the personnel changes and everything else and, and trying to get and, and having received more information from the state about how to predict health care costs with the change in the health care program, um, that 1.7 now looks more like 1 million. Might even be a little less than a million, but a million looks like is the, um, is the new target. So that's really good news. Um, <laughs> The, we've been meeting pretty regularly as an administrative team, so all the principals, Susan, Katrina, and myself, uh, we've met for three or four full days at this point. Uh, we've met all day today. We're meeting uh, pretty much all day Saturday. We're really working through to try and, and, and figure out ways to achieve this difficult target, but also reimagine the ways in which we utilize our resources. So a lot of the conversation I shared before about some of the, the work that's happening right now um, are the types of conversations we're happening, that we're having right now as an admin team and thinking, thinking pretty differently about how do we use resources and that our primary resource being the people we have to provide services to students. And um, thinking not so much about tweaking, I don't think that we're it's a challenging enough target that tweaking doesn't get us there. We have to really think differently about uh, how we go about doing our work, which is really exciting because uh, I happen to be a fan of, if you're not pleased with the outcomes of your work, try working differently. Um, not do the same and hope for something better. So what it has put us in a position of how to do is to hit that million dollar target um, that we have now, we recognize that that's going to mean fewer people. And we're working through, well, how many fewer people can we do this with and, and what kinds of positions um, do we need to change and how do we build capacity in the organization to ensure that those practices that are proven effective are happening everywhere. So really thinking about um, some pretty broad ideas about education and, and philosophy and shifting uh, what our approach might be, which is, Although it's, it's a great challenge to figure out how to do this, and it has, it has implications, it's also interesting to think about doing things differently and what that might produce. So um, I don't have a lot of concrete to offer because we're mid-process right now. We have, I think, three or four more full-day sessions scheduled to continue to work through this. Um, but it's both challenging and, and interesting and kind of exciting to think about how we might be able to do things differently with that focus on improving outcomes for students. Who, who else is kind of, this, that's such a big thing. And so are there other states you're looking at how they do it? Are you getting your teachers in and saying, well, we're, I mean, what works? I mean, or just, I mean, are you, is there, people that you're consulting to get ideas from different solutions or for different solutions? That so right now we've, we've been looking primarily at, so for example, the PECUS report, the, the district management group has uh, been commissioned by the Agency of Education to do a report. We're looking at that. We're looking at, at quality standards. Um, Susan pulled up a couple of articles from 19, what was 1988, oh, another one in 95, like we're Um, so we're really drawing on, on any resources that are available out there. We are looking at what other states are doing, what, what some of their staffing ratios are. So part of this is not only imagining how we can do things differently to improve outcomes for students with fewer people, but also needing, as we're forming also a single district for the first time, looking at equity across our schools. 
Um, and so that leads into conversations about staffing ratios and what is equitable, how do we define equity. Um, some, some really sort of high level, really important conversations to have that take some time to flesh out, but are, are critical in making the decisions moving forward. So it's been, I feel like it's been really fruitful. It's been many, many hours, and we, we're still getting along really well, and that's nice. Um, and we've worked through some really difficult stuff and come out in the end in a really good place still as a team, and, and even strengthening more so as a team. And it's, it's a tremendous shift for building principles as well to think now it's no longer thinking about my school. It's now individual building principles have to have the perspective of all schools. And for the first time ever, they're seeing information about staffing and everything else next to one another. And they're seeing the variations in, in supports and structures and opportunities for students. And, and the inequities are exposed. Um, and so we're sort of wrestling through all of that as well. I feel, I feel good about the process so far. I feel really positive about where we're going to end up um, in terms of outcomes for students. And yet it's still really, really hard. It's hard for the administrative team to figure it all out, but it's really hard to be also a, a teacher or a support staff member who doesn't know. Like being in the sort of in the dark and not really knowing what's gonna happen and wondering about your your employment and all those things are real. And unfortunately at this point in time there's not a lot we can do to alleviate that anxiety that folks have. Other than for, so I've had a couple of conversations with some support staff groups that have requested, you know, some time to just talk things through. I feel like those conversations have gone well. Um, and I think they can appreciate that we're not in a place yet where we have all the answers to the questions. We're working on it. Um, but it's, it's pretty complex and there are a number of things kind of coming together at the same time. That's both exciting but adds to the challenge. Yeah. Will we have a draft in December? Do you think? That's our target. That's why we're having as many meetings as we're we're having now to, to try and get the at least the staffing piece kind of figured out because that's with such a sum of money. I mean, that's going to be where the bulk of that million dollar savings is going to have to come from. Um, and then we can sort of do some fine tuning after that, depending on how close we get to that, to see um, where there might be some other areas to to find some savings as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty confident that we can have a draft budget for that December meeting. So I, I applaud you. I'm sure it's not easy to try and re-envision how to do things that we have habits and ways of doing. So I think it's great that your team is able to work so much on that. Um, that said, I, I personally have a very high level of frustration with our lawmakers right now because I feel like every year they come back with some brand new, brilliant idea of how we're going to make schools better um, or cheaper, really, is I think what they want. And I don't know that, it, that those each year, those things that come out, necessarily reward the schools that have tried really hard to meet whatever the desire was the previous year. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little concerned that if we really strip out everything we can, you know, and, and, and some of it may be really great new creative ways of doing things, that next year, there's going to be no way to meet whatever the new target is that you know that they decide is really great for us to do next year. So um, I feel nervous about going too deep this year and leaving you know then things that we really really don't want to get rid of, you know, being what's left when next year's initiatives and targets come out. That's hard because we only sort of know what building next year's budget is like we only sort of know what information we have to work with over the next couple of months to build next year's budget so we can't even imagine what we're going to have to work with this time next year for the following year's budget um, and, and I think you make a good point I think there have been schools that have done the work and, and made the hard decisions and that didn't necessarily benefit them next time around because it's based on some percentage of increase of, of your budget from one year to the next versus so it just doesn't necessarily always account for that um, and whether or not they begin to acknowledge that at, at the state level 
I've heard some conversation about it that's promising. I don't know where it's going to go from there. Can you um, <clears throat> remind me if you have the figure? I know that the, or I think that the $13 million is kind of coming out of the budget because of some of the health care, the decisions on the teacher health contract. I understand it was at 8.5 of that hit in FY18 statewide, and 4.5 hit in FY19. Do it's you know what our, what our share is of that 8.5? Uh, we're actually we're doing budget development, I guess, for 19. So in the year you're developing the budget for now, I think you know what our share of that is. Is there a number that kind of says, yeah, this is the amount that, that is kind of getting taken back? The clawback. Yeah. <laughs> like, do we have a number for our district? 43,000 for FY19? I, yeah, somewhere in that. And so it was around because it's 67, 63,000 and 18, something like that? This year. Yeah, or 80. Yeah, mid, about, around 65, yeah, uh -huh. for FY18. Okay, we're in. I was just curious. Uh, actually, 49783. For <laughs> FY19, for next year, 49,000. Okay, thank you. And it was about 65 ish, a this, a little more than that this year. Um, so it looks like you, you're having this community forum prior to the board meeting where we would get handed the first draft. So the, right, so the budget development timeline that's in here now is a draft and the, so the next um, topic for, uh, yeah, for action is to develop a community engagement plan for the budget. So that may change based on this conversation that I think is going to be coming soon in this meeting. A little bit like we don't get to see it until everybody else sees it, which you may, you may not have any choice because of the timeline. Um, there is a philosophical aspect to that, though. So sure. last year, maybe we want to hear everything we have to say about it before we make our own mind. Right. This simply sort of models what we did last year. Okay. That and the thinking at the time last year was to really sort of hear the community's sort of thoughts on the budget and take that into account as the board has to make the decisions it has to make. For the board to be seeing it for the first time and hearing the feedback at the same time as everyone else <coughs> might be beneficial rather than the board seeing it well in advance and beginning to formulate its own ideas prior to getting input from the community. So there's probably pros and cons to either approach. And I think that's part of what the board needs to talk about after is what's the what's the approach that works for this board with this new budget. And in many ways, things are different this time than they've been in the past. So, okay. well, we can move on to the uh, discussion to review the timeline. Looks like some people are already there. Maybe. Yeah. Sorry, I thought that's coming. <coughs> So I, I guess I, would, I didn't see that because it wasn't in the actual PDF of the packet, which is what I review when that gets sent out, but it wasn't in there, so I'm just working on oh. pulling it up. I guess it's linked in the Word, in the Google Document version. The budget development timeline. It says update budget based on new figures from state. Are those are those figures we already have? Or is that what you meant when you said we kind of had that, or was that something different? No. So so for example, so the target is for FY19 
per pupil, per equalized pupil spending to be the same as FY18. We don't get our equalized pupil figure, our first equalized pupil figure until it's supposed to be Friday. December 1st is when we're supposed to get it. We may not get it Friday, it might come after Friday. And in all likelihood, what we get Friday isn't going to be the real number. We'll get two or three or four versions of the equalized pupil number typically. And I think that's what it was last year. Right. So, okay. yeah. so and, and pretty much every time we meet, like there, there will be information we get after you adopt the budget. That we'll then have to adapt the budget. We, we okay. don't get to adapt. Oh, we budget. don't get to adapt because um, we've already. Right. Okay. And that's typical of what happens right. with some of those. Um, that's fairly standard. It happens all the time. In fact, sometimes we're holding on for a number just to have a clue of what we're looking at. And that's part of why board meetings tend to happen toward the end of the month, because it, it gives as much time as possible to receive the information we need to do the work that needs to happen so that you can approve the budget. One of the things I've noticed is in um, the town report, when you provide the three-year numbers going back, plus this current, or the year that we're um, building, the prior year that we were building, that number in the year before town report is not the same as in the following year, because then it's actually finalized. So it's, it's a moving target. So. <laughs> they were actually yeah, and all the same last year, though, Allison. Did they actually they stay actually the same? Oh, my. Same. Yeah, cause nothing well, maybe because it was so late yeah. in terms of when they finally finalized everything. Yeah. Um, since a lot of that has to do with student enrollment at times, what do you anticipate any drastic trends? Or are they looking about the same? or? I think we're going to see a, a continued sort of slight decline in enrollment. Mm -hmm. It looks like we will, I'm trying to remember the numbers, I'm sort of projecting, sort of bottoming out in the like 1375, I want to say. I have to go back and look. I sort of sketched out based on current enrollment, kindergarten through 12th grade, and sort of who leaves and who comes in and making some assumptions about kindergarten class sizes, which is always the hard thing to know. Um, but I think we were going to see a couple more years of decline, and we'll kind of sort of plateau. It'll be sort of like a little bit of a roller coaster kind of thing, but hovering at the, you know, 1375, 1385, you know, somewhere just under 1400 students. Right now we're just over 1400 students. And that's enrollment is connected to equalized people, right. but different from equalized people. Right. But typically when you see a decline in enrollment, you tend to see a decline in equalized right. people. So we're anticipating. FY19's equalized people number to be less than FY18. Um, we just don't really know how less. So the, our current ninth grade and 10th grade classes are really small. They're our smallest classes. So once the current ninth grade graduates, are we going to see a better enrollment number, do you think? That's one of the little blips. Uh, but it won't be the same. Because we kind of did this and we're doing that, and then once they leave our numbers, the incoming kindergartners and pre K and all of that seems to have stabilized, sort Not of, so kind much, of. Because the, the seventh and eighth grade class yeah, they're big. are the two largest. So you have sort yeah, of your they're two huge. smallest followed by your two yep. largest. So you have this. When your smallest class graduates, you see the sort of little bit of an uptick, and then the two big classes yeah. right behind them graduate, and then it kind of comes back down. And that's that sort of roller coaster effect that, yeah. that I was talking about. But for the most part, I think where it looks like we'll start to sort of plateau is just shy of 1,400 students. Okay, do you want to sort of put a hold on the, any further discussion around the timeline and get into the next piece? And if we have to come back, we can come back to the timeline discussion to make a change or add in any addition. So we'll table it until after the next item. Is that all right with everyone? Okay. All right.
right, then we'll get into our action item, which is develop a community engagement plan. And part of that discussion will involve will, um, approving a survey to go out and to talk about the press release that was um, prepared. So I don't know, Jen or Caleb, who wants to start? Um, I can, I can. So we, we had it on the meeting of our community engagement subcommittee. Um, we did discuss and develop a set of survey questions that Jen was kind enough to put into Survey Monkey. And those questions are more, they're not specific to a budget development community engagement meeting. They're just more um, general in terms of trying to understand uh, how uh, I think it's too sad. How uh, folks might want to be engaged. Um, so I think that it can, you know, apply to that, but it's not the uh, and the and then just the piece that I would say about the press release is this is something that um, we wanted to put out. We discussed having a, put together a press release that just sort of says where we are now. This is really as of the last meeting, which is just saying we have instructed Patrick to develop a um, level funding for pupil budget from 18 to 19. So um, just to kind of look at that. So I, I don't know that either one of these is specifically talking about what community engagement around the budget might look like, but that's what these two items are. Um, so I don't know what the best way is to, but I guess it, I don't know if it fits under this action item, but I guess we are hoping to get feedback and maybe approval to move forward with the survey. Um, so that's that's one goal that we can cover that. I don't know. Reading through, people have questions. I think that um, the statement at the top is sort of just trying to give people some context from which where we're, where these questions are coming from and then basically we're hoping to distribute these in the form of an online link the way we often have and and it's kind of mostly a check all that apply kind of survey just trying to trying to suss out like are the kind of meetings that we have had in the past maybe like forums and more formalized things are that the way to go we didn't ask questions about the kind of events we heard about today from Tori but we did ask about um, slightly different flavors of public meetings, slightly different topical um, versions to just kind of see is there one of these that lights up a little bit more than others? Is there something that we can say, oh, we haven't been doing that, but it looks like there's some interest. So it, it's a, certainly a first step, but we'll, you know, we're hoping can inform us that there's a, a hunger for a certain kind of engagement out there. That's how I would put it. Um, I find I like it except for the informal conversations like at events I'm already attending if I'm not already communicating with anybody then I'm not already attending these things and if we want I just feel like that's sort of a weird <coughs> phrase I just right. wonder if it should just say informal conversations or less formal conversations or less I think we meant there was kind of like athletic events or school concerts, and is that was that kind of the meaning of that one, Jen? Yeah, we were trying to basically say give an That's option that was like, I don't want to have to come to a school board thing. I want you to be where I am so that I can ask you questions. Like, you know, I mean, it, it could encompass being at the I don't know, being at the makes more sense the farmers market or you know whatever. So maybe there's a different way to say that. 
Um, or but examples of right. yeah, that's that's like, like, that's like just give them a couple examples. So I would have understood it. Then. Yeah, cause I see um, what you're saying. And I wonder if we want to add a choice of something that sounds like what Tori, Tori. was describing in yeah. formal, you know, small, small informal or conversations, small facilitated conversations. I don't know how you explain it in a way that people get it in a few words, but yeah. small coffee pledges. <laughs> right. House concerts without music. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Is the I should add a category like that, though. Yeah, only because um, is there something tricky about the informal conversations that I'm not? Uh, that's a tricky thing because we right there's some regulations around that, so that might just be something that we just. Do if you see people and know people and you handle it the way that we've been trained to handle it, but um, maybe just put something there that's an invite mm -hmm. and in the things that we're inviting them. Like um, press release newsletter could also say from porch forum, for instance, because we use that a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think what I was sort of envisioning with some of these choices is also that they're a little bit outside of the scope of, the, of what I think what we've sort of imagined. That, I mean, we're not going to have a, I mean, like that informal conversations one, it, it's sort of less, okay, so we're all going to scatter in the community every <laughs> every couple of weeks to try to, like, stake out the likely spots. It's more, it, it's, it's more just like, what's... What's the spectrum here? Is that is that part of the community desire? And then I think if if that was the number one response that everybody said, then I think we would admittedly have to go back and say, well, geez, what's that look like? A little bit. But I think that a little bit part of this is to be a little expansive and, and just like the types of engagement. And, and you know, I mean, I think... So that's just... It, it's maybe not every choice on here is something that we have a actionable plan for following up on yeah. right now. Just what are they like? Yeah. So like the affinity group or the um, neighborhood learning conversation or yeah. well, some of the and inviting like, board members in any here. position to start that until you know we decide whether we can we're gonna invest in a facilitator because I don't I don't right. think that's something right. you want to step into <laughs> with um, yeah. an idea. Or um, the coffee get togethers or um, people joining the board. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. So and so I think uh, part of the challenge in my opinion of the survey is to give some choices but not give twenty five choices, right. you know, keep it kind of broad enough that then maybe we can take that feedback and maybe we have follow up questions, <laughs> you know, maybe there's something that we learn from that and go, gee, what could that look like? But I mean, to me, part of what we're trying to get at with that first question is like, do you want to actually come to a meeting, or are you gonna? I mean, I'm guilty of this. If I don't, if I'm not invited because I'm on the board, like I'm like, oh man, it'd be so interesting for that not made renovation thing. But like, I gotta drive my kids to something else, and you know, I'm just I don't get there. And so we might get some really interesting feedback from people of, you know, well, if you're gonna have a meeting, if you offer this, then maybe I'll make want a meeting there. Or, you know, I just. Food and food and well, we did, we did actually put food and child care on the list. That's I don't perfect. know if we're in a position to do those things, but sure, wouldn't it surely be interesting if everyone said, gee, if you had child care, I'd make a point of coming. Like, maybe we'd get creative. Right. And, uh, and in terms of the budget meetings, this is where I thought it. I mean, if you get, you know, in the first week, you get some glaring results back, I think we could use that information as we head into That's that true. budget meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you know, preparing for that. Use what, what we what we learned along the way to help us through that first time. Sarah? I, I also get confused on number one where it says what formats would be most helpful for you to communicate with the school board members. Do you mean the school board members to communicate with you? I guess I'm confused on the, which, like if they, if I want to communicate with a school board member, I might like try to find one and write them an email. Like, I don't, I guess I would interpret that question differently. Right. 
Right, and I mean, maybe we should include maybe we should include that as an option. Do you want to you know just look up our emails? I think what we're kind of what what I think that question is asking is direct. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or, or have access to or yeah, yeah. I think it's kind of like access. Um, because it's true, yeah, if you want to say you know say something directly or have a direct concern, you might be able to do that. But I think the intention was sort of. You know, where would you like to find us? Or learn about um, what we're doing, or right. stay informed. Like, just I guess, what's the purpose? That's a good point. Though. Well, then we have our list over here: informed, consultant, yes. involved, collaborate, empowered. <laughs> so, well, I think um, so. Just to differentiate, though, is like we're wanting them to come communicate with us. So I mean, I think right. that we're we're sharing information with them, but I think a lot of it is like we are trying to solicit. A certain level of, of feedback, and so I think by saying communicate okay, with us, like I think it's less us sort of providing a lot of information and more of like hearing what people have to say. So I think that's also kind of the language piece there. Yeah. And you have the other space. Right. So okay. if somebody has an idea that you don't have. So instead of giving 25 choices, they give you a few, five. and then they give you one. And if that appears a number of times, it could be a good yeah, and way to go. Other, I mean, I'm sure you all have experienced the other giving you some. <laughs> well, and I did intentionally structure the other to look like a comment box, not yeah. because you can choose to have just one line where you might write email yeah. versus a box where it looks like you could mm -hmm. write sentences if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I guess to your point, John, there's no reason that this couldn't be a start to our budget development. Well, we provide, it certainly could provide us with some information as yeah. we go get closer to that meeting and, you know, go into it. Right. It's not specifically asking them about the budget, but that that's okay. I mean, People, if they want food and refreshments, that'd be good to know before that we get to that know. first meeting. <laughs> or weekends, that was another thing that yeah. we thought of. Like maybe like Saturday morning. mornings are more convenient for people than mm -hmm. right. you know, weeknights. Maybe some of us don't like doing <laughs> Saturday mornings, but if Brunch. they're going to get participation. <laughs> so then, I don't, do we need an actual, do we need an action from this board to launch the survey? Or? I was thinking about that. So this this survey was the piece of the communication committee, correct? And I thought we tasked them in the charge. To, I thought we were. I'll have to go back and look, and I hate to shuffle through the papers one more time. But Allison, so um, I would like to offer that there is currently a survey just released this afternoon for the Mount A Renovation Committee, um, and we're meeting on the sixth. So if we could, I don't, I don't know when you're planning on sending out this survey, but so that we don't confuse them, or we wait till after the sixth. I mean, since we're not going to have. Does uh, that delay you though? If you wait until the sixth, I, I don't know what what time frame you were looking for, releasing your survey. What did you think you were going to do? I don't know that we have a timeline. I think it depends on what the board's timeline is to yeah. if, if the board wants to have that input. I guess it depends on when that said budget meeting is going to happen. If it's going to happen in December, that might be challenging. If it's going to happen in January, then you know, that probably doesn't matter as much. might be nice to, if you figure that stuff is going to come in relative, within a two-week period, it might be nice to do it a couple weeks before the December board meeting. Um, but that could happen well after the 6th, right? Because the board meeting is 23rd. Mm -hmm. No, that would be good. No, I just looked at it. Oh, so it's, it's not it's that. It's a Tuesday. It's a week, the week uh, before Christmas. Yeah, so the 19th. The 19th, okay. That's yeah, and two weeks before that puts it everything. Yeah, okay. Wow. So but I also better. anticipate most of the responses to our survey are going to happen really quick. Because <laughs> we just had our meeting last night, yeah. the, the, or the, the meeting that turned into a community forum. We had that last night, and now the survey's gone out, and there have already been responses. So I would imagine by the weekend, 
Eat yeah. Friday. Yeah. yeah. Generally, um, people are going to respond. Like, they're going to do it when they see it because right. if they find a little way to do it later, they're the, not. So, the, unless right, you, yeah. you know, even if you announce it a couple of times, right. make it. Yeah. You know. So, if you need to release it, because it's Tuesday now, so. Food for thought. Okay. Sure. Um, it's interesting that you want to release this by electronic link in an email. And one of the questions here is, you know, what survey format is most useful for you? And it says paper surveys mailed to all households. And and um, it just brings up the point that there's a lot of folks out there that don't really, they still don't mess a lot, mess a lot with um, the internet and Facebook and front porch forum. And, they are taxpayers. My father-in-law is a good point. You know, he he's going to probably react to a mailing more than he would react to some other things. And I don't know what kind of budgets anybody has to do mailing. It's well, that is the biggest factor is that this doesn't need a budget. Right. Um, that's kind of my take. I, I take your point, and I and. And maybe it's silly to think you're going to get anybody to say, yes, I want a paper thing if you're reaching out to them in a non-paper format. I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess that it would be interesting to see if we get anybody saying that because at least in Act 46, uh, hearing some of the results, the, the expense of paper versus the response of paper and vice versa, I don't know if I said that well, is it, pretty dramatic. It, you, you get, you get um, those are some expensive paper responses you get back. Yeah. I guess it's. Right, yeah, and what we found with Act 46, we did a mailing, we mailed a postcard that wasn't the actual survey, but it was a postcard that had the link to the survey and told you you could pick them up in XYZ locations if you wanted a paper one. And we did get a bump of responses in the online survey after we mailed the postcard. So I think we reached people who maybe aren't on Front Porch Forum, so they hadn't seen it electronically, but they still went on the computer to fill out the survey. We got, I think, a sum total of five paper surveys. I mean, it was like less, I and mean, we made, I don't know, 300 or 500 copies in Port Sharon and put them out all over and recycled them all. Like, nobody used those at all. Right, right. So. I, I agree that there would be a benefit of getting it out to all the houses, but we just, you know, the cost of that postcard mailing, six or eight hundred dollars, I think. Yeah. And the logistics, you know, it takes weeks too. It's a good point you're making that. I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging. Thinking of the, I, I, I think she did a good job explaining because the affinity group, well, we each as a board could take it upon ourselves and everybody that when you do talk to people, say, hey, you know, be sure to print it out for somebody that you know doesn't go on the computer. And then, because it seems like you can't possibly, nobody knows everybody. You're not going to do it for everyone in your community. But we, we do, when you add up each individual person, we know a lot of the community. So you, 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 we could just offer and make a point, take it upon ourselves to print it out for somebody that you know wouldn't necessarily online to do it. I consider myself obviously pretty computer literate in my work and what I have to do. Um, but I, it's funny, I find that I read the Star Tribune Gazette because it's mailed to me and printed. I, I probably wouldn't go online and read it otherwise. It's it's just odd, you know, it's it's like I almost enjoy getting that every month, you know, and opening that up and seeing the scoop in it. And, and if there was a insert for a survey and something like that, I'd be interested to know how many people you would end up getting a response from. So if we could go back to the question of whether this board needs to take an action. So I, I know that my sense when we met as the, I thought we were the community engagement committee, um, but whatever committee we are, we, I wasn't aware that we had been given a formal charge. And so we did not take a specific action because we understood that we needed to bring recommendation back to this board. So if for the expedient um, moving forward of the survey, I think it would be great if we could make take an action tonight, because otherwise I think that the subcommittee would probably have to meet again right. to take an action to release the survey. Yeah. Um, I was looking back and I couldn't, there's a gap in the minutes. I couldn't, I couldn't find the minutes I needed to look at to see. Um, but we can certainly have an action item where we 
tell the committee to go ahead with the survey and put it up there. That'd be great. If you make the motion. Authorize the community engagement. Are you communication? Is that your? Uh, I thought we were the community, community engagement committee. Committee? Is that what you're saying? Subcommittee. Were? Community engagement we, subcommittee. That's what we've been calling. That's what we've been warning our meeting times. There we go. That's what we are. Subcommittee. Yes. Community engagement subcommittee. That's, that's official. All right. So yeah, actually, that's what we're to authorize the community engagement committee to take action on the survey. Yes. Are you making that, sir? Yes. <laughs> I am so moved. So moved. Yes. <laughs> All right, I'll, is there I'll a second? second that. Which is Caleb. All right, any further discussion? Yeah. All those in favor of the Community Engagement Subcommittee taking action on the survey, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. And aye. we'll get front porch forum posters in different towns can, that can be mm -hmm. part of our our action that we're going to start taking. Is yeah. And we do have a, a supervisor union account that posts to all five towns. Oh, great. So we we yes. get to send four, you get four a month. A month. At four a month, yeah. So um, it's been brought to my attention mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. the, the last post that, that I sent in that um, for the for the representatives on the renovation committee, that it didn't make it to all towns. It didn't make it to Moncton. It didn't go in Starksboro. Right. And yeah, I didn't see Karen's. That. Karen had heard that, and she went and checked yeah. and was convinced yeah. it was. So I, I looked back and that was in you know further. Uh -huh. just, I just I see Karen's in Bristol's. That's usually all. Bristol is the only place. So I don't know if if, yeah. if yeah. they're shorting yeah. you or what. Not getting our money's worth if that's yeah. the case. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That was just my point. Because <laughs> usually when Karen does post yeah. the, the global one, I see it in all of the towns. Right. And I and this one, I didn't. Yeah. And yes, somebody brought that up. Yeah. yeah. So just an FYI. So, so do you, and the press, now on to the press release. Do you need any action on that? Or does um, anybody have any comments on the press release? Or are they good to go on that one? I like it. I, uh, I don't know if we need an action. I think it was requested that we draft something at our last meeting and draft we have, so maybe we should just have an action to, sure. I, I don't know, I, it, should it, it? Should I, and then to it, just to clarify whether as chair of our subcommittee I would take <clears throat> the next step or if this is being handed to whoever gives press releases to the press. I, I guess I'm asking, is that is that me to do that next step? I don't know how the next step. How do press releases happen? Do, you, Where do, press do they just send them to Gayen? Is that what happens? Uh, or can you just submit it? You can just submit it. I'm just I don't recall specifically who it needs to be submitted to. Is all. Yeah, okay. And so I would say, if if you want to find out who to submit it to and submit it, that's the way to go. Or yeah. we send it to Karen and and we can. Okay. I'm happy to. I think I get some address for like letter to the editor stuff, but some, you know, and 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 then it's just a matter of who we submitted to as an independent, right? Is that the norm? Yes. So, I I think probably this meeting is not the time to get into this, but we did have some discussion and within our subcommittee about whether we were a community engagement subcommittee or a communication subcommittee, and I personally see that those are related but not the same thing and so I think it would be very beneficial perhaps at our next meeting if there's time to have some discussion about what the actual charge of our subcommittee is um, you know we, we discussed whether we should draft something and see if everyone likes it or whether we should discuss it at this board first but I know that we were feeling a little bit uncertain about beyond drafting a survey what we were actually tasked with going forward to do. I feel like I saw a note that I wrote myself that you were going to come back with an idea of of what you you wanted your, you thought your charge would encompass, and I don't. It's on a late morning. Yeah, no, I, and I, I seem to that. think that that we we're going to look for you to you for some guidance. So so how about? How about that, if everyone's in agreement? You come back and tell us what you think the scope of your work's going to be. Make a note on that. But I'll, I'll make sure it's on the agenda. How's that? Great. Does that work for everyone? 
And then do you want formal action right now from the board on um, improving the place to go, to go forward? Yes, and I'm happy to handle it. Okay. I can be so. Would you like to make that so motion? Authorized. So we're making a motion for the to approve. Go ahead. The approve for the, the community with the engagement subcommittee to uh, release the or press release. <clears throat> Yes. I'll is second that. that, that. <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> Any further discussion? Right. There are no other um, boards that are going to be putting out a similar release then, right? We no, because we're the only one building a budget. Okay. So, so, we'll have, so um, Allison and Caleb. I guess, oh, okay. Can I just ask? Yeah. I, I would maybe suggest that depending on the decision that we make about our community engagement plan for the budget, perhaps there might be a small adjustment to that last sentence. Sentence, if like if we have more detail, that we could include that. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. With necessary changes. Right. Did you catch that, Shana? With necessary changes. Yes. Anyone else? All those in favor of approving the community engagement subcommittee um, release, doing the press release with necessary changes regarding the budget, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. All right. Okay, so back to the budget development timeline. Is there anything that we feel we need to change? Or add in or make a revision? Um, do we want to continue, are we still going to try to, I mean, given we don't know what the feedback's going to be or what our response is going to be and we are only 18 days away from our next meeting, are we going to try to hold a meeting before, like a community meeting before, or are we going to wait on it? Like, do we want to keep that in our timeline or do we want to be flexible around that depending upon, I mean, I just, we're not, it's not even three weeks really out, right? Maybe exactly three or three weeks exactly from our next meeting. So we'd be trying to fit in a community forum prior to that meeting. So I just, I, we can leave it in. I mean, and if we get enough responses and are able to pull it together, but I mean, I guess, do we feel, just given the conversation we just had, like, do we feel that's feasible? I, I just feel like it'll be a little tight, but it will yeah. Well, I guess. <laughs> The wrong number. <laughs> this is actually a high school in the IED. That's okay. Okay. Centers for Disease Control. Oh. I'm going to do a survey. Do you want to do We have a list. So I guess my feeling is if we are going to go forward to the forum on the budget before the next meeting, it would not include any input that would come from the survey. We would need to make a plan for that and then we would be able to learn from the survey for future forums. Um, it seems to me that, you know, it's this, really the same discussion we had last month of if we have a forum now, we don't actually know anything <laughs> about the budget. Um, so no one on the board is going to be able to speak at all about what's in the budget. So I personally don't feel prepared to say whether we should have it. I think it's a question of is there going to be something to talk about? You know, the idea I think always has been that if we, if something can be presented early, then the board can have time to incorporate, and the board and the administration can have time to incorporate that feedback in the work because often we get the feedback too late to do anything with it. Um, so to me, I think it's a question for you <laughs> about whether there's, you know, whether there's going to be enough to be able to talk about um, in a meaningful way. I think it depends a little bit. So if it depends on what you're after. So if uh, if it's a reaction to a presented budget, you get certain information. If it's before anyone's seen a budget, what's important to you as community members for us to keep in mind? I mean, there, I think there's different ways to go about it. Um, I think your point that it's three weeks away. Uh, I suspect we will need every day of those three weeks to be able to finish the work that we're in the midst of and actually have something um, put together in a format 
to begin to get our heads wrapped around. Um, so the, the reality of something prior to that, I think, would be difficult. Perhaps not impossible, but really difficult. Um, I think I think the conversation has to begin with what what's your desire as a board for information from the community, and then how can we get to that point? Well, last year we did something similar. Um, we had that meeting at Bristol Elementary, and. Um, <coughs> We did get some information because there were exit surveys, so we did get some information from from that, and it, um, it wasn't in a board meeting format. It was more of a presentation, and board members were there kind of thing. So, well, and I think the other piece, and this is, I think, a conversation that came up last month at this meeting. Um, sort of roles and responsibilities. Who's doing what for this community forum? There. So last year, it was really myself and, and the administrators that presented the information. Um, and there was a conversation at, at this meeting last month about should it be board members presenting the information and collecting the, uh, the feedback um, in an effort to show sort of the, the board's role and responsibility for sort of owning the budget. Even that conversation would be good to sort of flesh out and, and know where does the board stand in terms of what does it want as its responsibility for a community forum and what would be the superintendents and that's all driven by what you hope to get out of a community forum. Sir, as a, I'll say this, often as a teacher in a school, I've had it presented, here's what I'm going to be presenting to the school board this evening and it's been almost on that day, and it's been very informative, so there wasn't a lot of shock at the same time, or surprise. There's been, you know, here's where we're starting, and then the conversation happens. That always, uh, we always send at least one teacher plus to every single board meeting, especially that one. Um, parent groups are sort of invited to go to it, and I just, I think it's good to have the conversation with people at the table, like she, for Lori, mm -hmm. is that her name, was talking about, and I think the purpose would be so that the budget that's presented eventually is at a cost that we think is reasonable, right? I don't know. I, I, I think as a board member, I'm going to learn at that moment. Um, and I don't think I can own it until I learn it. But I also think there should be other players involved in the conversation. So I sort of like the idea of, I don't know if I would call it a forum, but I would definitely have it be, we want as many people involved in this, even the first look. I don't care if I'm looking at it for the first time as a board member or somebody else, but um, but for my own opinion. Given that we're gonna have a tight turnaround if we can do it, do you, does your office, Patrick, have the resources to be able to kind of, and I know I, I've talked about this, I'm not saying it's been our will as a board, but the kind of budget narrative idea, the kind of idea of, okay, we're, we're developing this budget with zero percent growth, where's the rubber really hitting the road so that we can kind of give people an idea of like, okay, well here's what this looks like right now, so people can say, Oh my God, that's cutting way too deep. I can't imagine that. Or, boy, we don't think you're cutting enough. We kind of think that, the, you know, just to even give people some kind of a measuring stick to say, yeah, we've, we've kind of done some things and here's really, I mean, is that something that when that draft budget is going to come, is it going to be all we can do just to get the whole thing? Or is, is it possible to do that work along with it so that we're positioned to make, I, I'm not saying make a pitch or a case for exactly, but to make an accurate portrayal of it with this community. Yeah, there, there are two things that, that come to mind as I think about the timing. Um, so one is actually doing the work to put it together. And doing that with sufficient enough time leading up to the board meeting that we can engage in conversations with our schools and, and the teachers and support staff. And they shouldn't hear it for the first time by watching the TV. Right. Um, so we need to, so that's the, the greatest concern is 
having the time to do both of those things. Um, and it's, there's a lot of work to do still. When did we do that community forum last year? Did we do it in December or did we do it in January? It was December. If we had a community forum, like if we did, if you all, central administration did your work to present us the narrative at the December 19th, right. 19th meeting so that we see it as a board and then hold a community forum in January so that um, we can get through the month, everybody can get through the month of December because 18 days in December with all of the other holiday stuff that happens at school and families, um, I, I don't know that having a community forum also in December would be a wise decision. Yeah, I, I think that's where my gut was, was landing, was that maybe it's something we can book in the first week of January. I think also it's just going to be hard to get people there, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. right before Especially the holidays, yeah. you know, and we're asking them to come out and talk about the Mount Ave renovation, and you know, I mean, there's just, there's a lot going on, and so I think the, the risk, the trade-off might be, nobody shoot me, that maybe we have to have one more than one meeting in January if we get a lot of, in, if we need to, you know, do something with that input, but I just don't know, like, I don't see that we're going to, be ready to have a meaningful conversation and to be able to get people to come to the table yeah, in December. Yeah. Um, I, I do think you made a really good point about what do we want to get out of the conversation and I always struggle with this with budgeting because it falls so much back into the ends and the means and the you know I mean because really you know as a parent if we come out and say well it looks like we're going to cut a million dollars and we'll be like where, is my kid still going to have a classroom teacher? You know, like I, I immediately am going to be sucked into the paranoia of the details, right? Just like you were saying, you know, it's, I think it's affecting the staff as well. Of what does this really mean? And so I think that the way that we keep it an ends related conversation is to be able to have, like what Caleb was saying, this sort of so we've asked for this target. Right? We we're targeting you know this level funding, the ed spending, pre class people, which means we've got to cut a million dollars out of the budget. Big picture, this is what that means. You know, the trade. You know, the other side is so we don't cut a million dollars out of the budget, and we maybe have tax impacts or you know, like it's it's that. How does our community balance the the costs versus the the benefits? Is I think the, what that what that conversation needs to look like, and it shouldn't be at a well. I want one more paraeducator in the Bristol Elementary. You know, like that's not what the conversation is. But at the same time, like you have to have at least some level of detail for people to be able to wrap their head around. Right, and that that's sort of the idea is to be able to say so. This was the target. Um, here, here, the, here's the reason for the target. Here's the implications for meeting the target in terms of. Tax, tax rates and whatnot, but then people really want to know, as do you as a board, so what did it take to get there? And do the, the pros of cost savings um, sort of justify or outweigh the cons of the changes that needed to be made to achieve that? Um, that's, that's what you want as a board, that's what individual community members are going to want to know, and that will drive their opinion. The challenge then is, to not allow the process to go to a point of people saying that's, for example, that's too deep a cut, that position ought to get added in. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. right. Which is kind of what you were saying. So we have to sort of, to give enough detail, to contextualize it, to have people really <laughs> understand how they feel about the decision, but then not micromanage. If they say those are, I think the, the appropriate response could be those cuts are too deep, instead of level funding, you spend 1%. Like, so somehow, say, spend more to not cut so deep, but not say where the cuts How would that be done? Mm -hmm. that, that values to say, um, <clears throat> you can be very descriptive about how you'd say to make the chocolate cake, or you can just say, make a chocolate cake kind right. of thing. So I think we have to keep in mind mm -hmm. how descriptive 
we are in our discussion. I think Basically, down that, road. that target <coughs> w uh, that target produced changes that are unacceptable, so we're going to change the target. Go back and redo it with this new target. Like that's sort of the level that it needs to stay at. Yeah. Right. Now that we're thinking about it this way, I think that makes sense. January, and I think we are going to want to figure out a facilitator for that. So that it's not a school board versus community thing or administration versus community because that's what things felt like. I think we're going to want to find somebody because um, um, that's too much. I don't think yeah, it's got to be a neutral party in the middle of that conversation for people to say this is how I feel about it. And we could even do an exit survey. Just a real quick, you know, it should be lower, it should be higher, almost like a vote. Not a vote, but a vote kind of. And just to get a, a sense of maybe people that don't speak up and they're just sitting there listening. Um, and that could say a lot about developing something that would pass without anything specific at all. Just the cuts are too deep. Like the two options you just gave could be the survey, the exit survey. Because otherwise, if there's not somebody in the middle, I can see why she said that's important. It's just, I mean, I'm even amongst myself. I'm not sure how I feel, and I'm arguing with myself about it. So I let alone the community to us. So if we could have the time and put it into January, and then maybe we could really make it be what we want it to be. Jen? I wonder if we could follow the a similar structure to what we used for one of the Act 46 community engagements up in Lincoln, mm -hmm. um, because I think that that was fairly productive. So there was um, a brief presentation and there were kind of like different parts of the meeting, but the part that I think is helpful was that then everyone broke out into small groups and they had a sheet with specific questions. And it wasn't like 25 questions, it was like three questions, but the questions can try to guide the discussion and then each group had to take notes of you know what kind of some of the things that came up. And I think people could fill out their own sheets and I'd have to look back at my notes. Um, but it's a way that you get more people talking and that was really we were really worried we didn't want the three people who always raise their hand to you know talk for 45 minutes and then the other people in the room to never say anything so maybe we could do something along that structure and as you were both talking i was thinking about rebecca's smiley face yes uh, sad yep, face yep, that's yep. all we need on an exit survey i mean right we could go as simple as would you be happy with this, or would you be unhappy with this kind of thing? Yeah. I think you need a second question, though, because you don't know if they're unhappy because it's too much or too little. Well, we could frame, you know, you know, <laughs> you know do, you just, do, you support, do you support this budget or not? Yeah. It could be the, the Goldilocks approach. Is it too hot? Is it too cold? <laughs> there you go. Right. There you go. Right. Yep. We have two oh, jars of candy. Yeah. One. <laughs> 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 All right. All right. All right. So, something off our plan in this is enough. that just yeah. happen does it can that just happen as far as like I'm hearing people say they want to move the community forum to January since yep. that was this isn't a board developed timeline it's more out there so I think is everyone in agreement to push that to January yes yeah okay. early early January, early January. Right. yep right. <coughs> okay because I want to keep us moving we're kind of off our time track all right, everybody okay? Can I just confirm what I believe to be true? Sure. What I think we're planning on? Uh-huh. And this may, this may take different action. So, I think what I heard was a desire for a potential second meeting in January. So, beyond the, the forum. So, December, the intent being to have a draft. Yeah. And then early January have the community forum and then the regular meeting in January to mm -hmm. approve? Or was there another January well, meeting? Only if we if something happens at the forum that mm -hmm. leads us to believe we have to do something different would we need that additional meeting if, if that's the way I understood when you were talking, Jen, right? If it comes up that we gathered some gigantic piece of information that you know, forces well, us to But how are we going to determine that if we don't meet to review it? And so that I was reflecting back on last year, and the, and the reason why it happened prior to the December meeting last year was so that 
the board could hear the community feedback prior to its December meeting, review the budget, review the feedback, give direction to me to bring a revised January version of the budget for adoption. So we would need to probably a week out from the forum date plan right. a, a meeting for us. Just to otherwise you just you, with the agenda item to review the forum the community forum feedback. feedback. You just you wouldn't have an opportunity to reflect on the community feedback and have the potential to give me new direction based on the community feedback to have it ready for adoption in January. We have to adopt. So yeah, we have to adopt. We're even looking into so January 30th I think is our very late January. I think it's the 30th is the January board meeting. We need to just double check to make sure that that is, is enough far enough is not too late that we can't get things warned and out to printers and all that stuff for town meeting. Mm -hmm. It's the 23rd. 23rd, okay. So that's better. I have one in for the 23rd and one in for the 30th. I'm not sure. I have two. Bye. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the all board work plan says January 30. Or December. I don't know why I have the 23rd. I have the SD meeting on the 30th. So. I might have put, I could have put it in wrong. I don't know. I don't know. I have a booth in there. Yeah. So. Yeah. I have it in mind for the 23rd, so then maybe we may have. So we need to clarify. Technically, that. the 23rd is the 4th. It's the 4th. Maybe that's Tuesday. Yeah, maybe I just like to do it. Well, I don't know if we meet on the 4th Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Well, I don't know if we meet on the 4th Tuesday or the last Tuesday. Which would be that? It's not the same well, as January. On the ANESU calendar, it's January 30th. Well, which is better? Which is more? Which is a better well, day? it's going to depend on that timeline date. Oh. Because if the timeline date is That's just the 29th, oh. then we have to back up that date. The 23rd is because definitely we safer. Have, yes. We have to yeah. warn it by X number of days. There's like all these rules about. So 30 but not 40. The 30th right, maybe. the two things are warning it at appropriate time and being able to get it to printers in time to have right. everything ready. For the town report. And they're not necessarily the same window. 23rd it is. And the, the, only, the only meeting on the January calendar is us on the 30th. There's um, no exactly. carousel meeting or anything then. Well, the executive so. will meet that month too, but we'll have to determine. Could be the same night, could be a different night. Depends right. on what's going on. So I, okay. I think what I'm hearing is someone moving to change the date from the 30th to the 23rd. I would be happy to make that motion. All right. <laughs> do you want me to say it, Sean, or do you get it? Okay. All right. So Jen made a motion to Mary a second to move the January <coughs> from the 30th to the 23rd. Is that right? Yep. Uh, any further discussion? Who seconded it? Barry. Barry. <coughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? All right. Okay. So. so how does the other stuff get scheduled? Do we need to do that as a board? or? I think it would be good to pick some dates and yeah. just to have some clarity and that will give me some direction to... Is that, is that a good use of our time to go through dates? We don't have everybody here. Maybe uh, a doodle poll. Maybe, maybe, maybe a doodle poll would be better. Karen could do a doodle poll. Yeah. Two. One for a community forum date, and then a week after that to have a board meeting with just one item. It seems to me that the community forum would have to be in the first week of January. Exactly. And the board meeting would have to be in the second week of January to allow enough time for the administration to react. Correct. Should any reaction be required? Yes. That's correct. So community forum first week of January. Yep. And then a week out for the board to meet. And a board meeting second week of January. Are we want to stick to Tuesdays. I think the doodle poll will probably answer that. We'll, just, we'll do more of a day for them. All right. Do we need to go through anything else? Um, um, there's budget second. Oh. Development timeline. Jen. 
So I, I heard Patrick suggesting it would be good to have some clarity about who might be presenting. Is that something that we want to decide at our December meeting? Maybe we don't need to determine that yet since we're moving to January? Do we I, think we to could, I think we could. We're running a little behind schedule tonight, so I think we could. Um, I'll write myself a note and get it in the next agenda. Plus, at the December meeting, we're probably going to want to discuss what the community forum is going to look like, since December meeting will be our only meeting before the community forum. We'll have the, just the December meeting is going to be a carousel, right? So we're already going to be tight on time, because we're always tight on time when it's a carousel. And we're going to be seeing a draft of the budget for some for some time. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be a really We'll be very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have that down to, to add to the next agenda. Okay, then we'll move, keep moving along. Everybody good? Down to board management and governance. Um, we have an action item to accept the monitoring report for 4.1. Um, this is, was written and the executive committee is going to receive that tomorrow night. It is different than a typical monitoring report because um, after a discussion at the policy governance table, um, I took on the task of writing it, but I, I said for this board to see what the report looked like, I was going to leave the last information from the last time it was monitored there, and then just add in the current, my, my current comments. So typically there wouldn't be that piece of 2016 conclusion in there, it would just be the one year back. But I left it in because I thought it would be useful for this board, for the members who hadn't seen the monitoring board to, to look at that. So um, the executive committee will see this tomorrow night. Um, I did add some information <coughs> in that about this board because I thought it was um, a way to present some information to the, the executive committee um, who had not been good about training. And this board taking the task on and having the training at the meetings, I think, has been helpful because it gives everybody the information all at the same time. So I did put that in the report for the executive committee to see as well. So, okay, this is just a practice item for us. To make a motion to accept the monitoring report 4.1 in governing style. Any second. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor of accepting the monitoring report 4.1 governing style, um, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Okay. Next action item is to accept the interpretation of 4.7 governance investment. I make a motion to accept the interpretation of 4.7 governance investment. All right. Is there a second? I second it. Sarah, any further discussion? All right, all those in favor of accepting the interpretation of 4.7 governance investment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, discussion, the letter from Governor Scott, that was included in the packet. Anything you want to discuss? It did say in there that they were considering possibly finding a way to change the um, timeline that we were discussing that for, about how challenging it is to get the budget done and have enough time and all of that. So maybe that'll happen. That would be good. To get the, the equalized spending per pupil to our earlier, things like that. So that would be nice. <laughs> Hopefully it's not shorter. Yeah. I just have a question. And so that you know <laughs> that they're committed to working to develop a range of tools to support and accelerate our innovation. And have they yeah. started to develop those tools or shared what those tools are or anything along those lines? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are there any are there any innovative things that have 
not think it's going to happen. That was really the one thing that stood out to me that I hadn't seen, is that you know we're driving innovation, but I hadn't actually heard of any innovation which had sort of been forthcoming. So okay. just curious. <laughs> Do we know this education summit that's referred to here is, is scheduled? I think it's scheduled. Um, I think it's, it's somewhat by invitation. I don't think it's necessarily a sort of a broad, open to anyone education summit. Because they don't, are they in recess at the moment? And come back in January? Right. So they still have, they still can have like committee meetings and stuff, yeah. Right, but generally speaking, they don't meet in December. True, but this didn't sound like a legislative meeting. I mean, it's a little vague. It's right. why we'll host an education <coughs> summit in December. I mean, that's the level of detail, but it's it's not like the letters to legislators. Uh, yeah. I believe, I, th I think I recall seeing an email speaking to even having rep a representative or some number of representatives from the superintendents in present. So it's not, that's where I'm kind of getting the by invitation sort of. Well, I, I definitely noticed that this invites <clears throat> thoughts in return, and it does seem that um, some of the feedback that we sometimes have around some of the, you know, the timing of these things, not only year to year with budget stuff, which is less to this point, but in terms of the moving targets of, you know, Act 46, and then, you know, everything that's happened since then, even though that's not so long ago, just, and, and I know that there's many other, to, and, and that moving goalposts are part of the game, but I do think that um, just as a, my personal opinion is that the way that the, the, you know, the tax stuff was introduced last year with no time to go through committee or talk about it, and with the budget held hostage to it is a terrible way to develop policy. Um, but I would say maybe constructively from that, that, or trying to say something constructive from that, that you know, we need to make sure that we're giving the, the because it has been raised you know, in some of the articles we've had that people who negotiated their um, labor contracts early are kind of being punished by this uh, you know, because they might have done some work, some work earlier, not in all cases, but um, that, and I just think that even though people do give this feedback, it's important for school boards to give, give the feedback to say, hey, you know, if, if the Scott administration has good ideas on, on health care stuff, you know, please give us a reasonable opportunity to, to talk about it and participate in, in an open uh, legislative process because this is where the rubber hits the road on these decisions and so often they're, they seem to be less in the public view. So I'll get off my soapbox, but that is what I would say about this letter is that I hope that there is a response from school boards and maybe from our board that says, yeah, we hear you, and as we're having good conversations in the future, maybe let's have you know time to talk about them before they're enacted into law. That's all I think about this letter. The communications board would like to craft it. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me that the community engagement board would not. Don't don't cut me too much. <laughs> 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 that we have talked about um, public comment and how it's handled and I just want to sort of remind everyone that there's some guidelines at the bottom of our agenda that talk about public comment and it's not typically a time when we engage in a lot of back and forth discussion on a, on a topic because um, you know if somebody comes with an I with something they want something to happen we can't Act on it anyway. Um, we are we have an agenda for a reason because it so spells out our, our work for our, our meeting and to give. When when I first got on the board, people would say, "Well, you can't really 
address anything somebody brings to you in public comment because what about the, the other people? What about somebody else who had had a you know something to say about that? They you have taken away their opportunity to comment, and if you make a decision, you really eliminated them out of the conversation. So it's it's a listening. Um, sometimes there can be some direction. You know, maybe the person they can be directed where to go to get some of the information they're looking for, but it's typically not a back and forth. It's a time to listen kind of thing. And I just wanted to, to remind people of that kind of thing. So with that being said, is there any public comment? <laughs> All right. Um, we have our meeting evaluation. And I don't think we have one online, so I think we just do it in person. I don't think ours is online yet. Um, so what is the level of engagement of all board members? Your choices are high, low, and uh, you can give some comments. I think the level of the engagement of the board members who are present was great. And that reminds me of another piece, which I'll, I'll send out an email to everybody. But if you're going to miss a meeting, if you can just shoot me an email, because then it helps keep track of a quorum so that we can, uh, I'll, you know, uh, Ollie can know ahead of time if we're going to be struggling and have to reach somebody by phone or something. So um, if you could definitely just shoot me an email that says, I'm not going to make it, then I can plan accordingly. So. OK, was the agenda followed? Yes. 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 Any comments? I have a question. Maybe a comment. So we used to have a section of the agenda where you could bring up things that weren't specifically on the agenda. And I know that that section has gone away. I'm assuming that's part of our efficiency. But it leaves no opportunity to bring up things that weren't envisioned on the agenda, even yeah. as a board member comment or whatever, so perhaps we can <coughs> consider what structures might be available for board members to make comments about so, the um, agenda. That right. was a result that... of some policy governance work um, that, that it came about that it really should be removed from the, all agendas. There shouldn't be a board other because it, it, the work is spelled out and you know, we should stay within our work. So. Um, I can certainly have a discussion back at the COP policy and governance, and, and perhaps there's some brainstorming we can come up with as, you know, well, <laughs> or perhaps it means, we're already awake now. <laughs> perhaps sure. the appropriate channel is to provide feedback directly to the chair outside of the meeting, sure. or if there's a, okay. Yeah. yeah, that would work too, something, that's always an option. Um, <clears throat> and if I need more information or if I need, you know, I can get to the bottom of it or research it and get back to you. Okay. Um, what went well with me? <sighs> yeah, Tori was awesome. It was good. Anyone else? I also thought we had a really productive discussion about how we want to handle the next steps of the budget. I thought that was good. Yeah, I thought so too. I appreciated the update on what's happened so far. Uh, what suggestions do you have for ways to improve future meeting? from the principals um, and so I don't know in what way that might ever be part of what happens at this board but I have always found that to be a really valuable part of the local board meetings I feel very disconnected from each of the schools since we always meet here in this room with all you wonderful people from the central office um, but I think and perhaps that's something that the community engagement subcommittee can think about in the future but I think more sense of connection with the individual schools that make up this district would be great. Mm -hmm. I see I'm going to get my thing in one way or another. <laughs> 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 okay. 
why it's there. Okay. All right, I've captured it. Okay, anyone else? Okay. A motion to adjourn. A move to adjourn. All right, Megan? I'll second. Barry, second. All those in favor of adjourning? <laughs> 11 minutes Aye. early? Yeah. <laughs> Please